So over uh, six days in April, this committee held a unprecedented series of hearings on the topic of public safety and Pennsylvania gun laws. At those hearings, I invited any member of the House of Representatives to come forward to outline their proposals, ideas, and concerns on this very, very serious issue. I was very pleased, and the members of the committee were very pleased, to see that 37 members participated in those hearings. The result was a unique exchange of ideas and viewpoints. It quickly became clear to me, and this was no surprise, but it's clear to me that this is a very difficult to find common ground in Pennsylvania on the topic of firearm, firearms laws. Yet that is my goal. I know we all have, are united in protecting Pennsylvania from harm. And I also know we are united in protecting our citizens' constitutional rights. So while we won't agree on everything, it is my hope from those hearings and today's hearing to identify good legislation that the House can support, which will better protect Pennsylvanians from violence while also respecting the constitutional rights of us all. Today, we are continuing that dialogue. I have invited several of the most well-known advocacy groups to join us and to offer their viewpoint on the issue of public safety and Pennsylvania's firearm laws. I'm also very pleased to say that so many are here and have agreed to offer their input to this committee. Just want to take a moment or so, uh, just a few comments about the murders at Santa Fe High School in Texas late last week. Tragically, it no longer seems shocking to hear about school shootings. And that is a call to action for all of us. But while we are le still learning facts about Santa Fe, the Santa Fe murders, what I've learned so far illustrates the, difficult, the difficulties of stopping this violence. Santa Fe High School was a hard, hardened target. It won a statewide award for its safety plan for active shooters. It had two armed school resource officers on site. One of those officers was critically injured when he confronted the shooter. The shooter did not use an assault weapon. He carried a shotgun and a handgun. Those firearms had been legally purchased. As far as I know right now, while the shooter was obviously disturbed to say the least, he did not show the kinds of red flags that might have led to an involuntary mental health commitment. The shooter didn't have a prior criminal history, and law enforcement had not missed any possible tips about this violence. These hearings are not confined to school shooting incidents. We are also talking about safety in our homes, our communities, and our neighborhoods. But I mentioned these thoughts to highlight the extreme difficulties we as a community is facing in addressing the issue of public safety when amending our state's firearm laws. I just want to remind the members, our testifiers, and those who are attending this hearing of one more thing. I am grateful to everyone who made the first step set of hearings a success by having an honest, civil discussion. No, traded, no one traded insults, and the public who attended listened attentively and shared their input with their elected members afterwards. I expect to have that same kind of discussion today. As part of that, I want to re reiterate something I said at the conclusion of the members' hearings in April. For practical reasons, I have not been able to give an open microphone at these hearings to everyone who might wish to share their viewpoint with, it, with us. But I do welcome broad public input. For anyone who would like to submit written testimony, please send it to my capital office in Harrisburg, where I will collect that testimony for all the members to read. So with that, I just want to also uh, acknowledge and thank uh, Harrisburg University for their uh, generous hospitality uh, today. Appreciate uh, you having us here. With that, I'm going to ask members to uh, introduce themselves. We'll start down on my far left. Check. All right. State Representative Todd Stevens from the 151st District in Montgomery County. Gary Knowles, the 124th District, which encompasses a portion of Berks, Google, and Carbon Counties. Ted Nesbitt, 8th District, Mercer, and Butler Counties. Becky Corbin, 155th District in Chester County. Steve Bloom, 199th District, Cumberland County. 
Tom Demick, Committee Executive Director. Ron Marsica, Chair of Dolphin County. Joe Petrarca, Democratic Chair. Chairman Petrarca for uh, remarks. Thank you, Chairman. I too want to thank the testifiers of um, our two weeks of hearings uh, a few weeks ago on, uh, on gun violence. I thank the members for, for sharing their thoughts on this um, very important topic. Um, I also thank the testifiers here today. This is, this is obviously an issue that is very, very important to a number of people on uh, all sides uh, of this issue. I think we have to find a way to deal with what is happening in our communities and in our schools uh, in an effective way and also protect the rights of law-abiding gun owners. Um, and hopefully we can work through that and consider all viewpoints and opinions and um, maybe do something or not do something that makes sense for the people of Pennsylvania. Thank you. Thank you. Our first testifier this morning is Scott Folkrod, Associate Professor of Philosophy and Legal Studies here at Hasbro University. Scott. Good morning. Good morning, folks. Yes, uh, you may begin when you're ready. Uh, welcome to Harrisburg University. I'm really glad that you're able to come here uh, to have this hearing today. And you're always welcome back, of course. Um, Representative Marsco, I'm glad you, oh, and, and welcome here on behalf of uh, University President Eric Dar and the Board of Directors also, who wanted me to uh, convey their welcome to you. Uh, I teach courses in, obviously, uh, based on my title, I teach courses in law and philosophy, but I think more importantly for this hearing, I teach uh, a course that's required of all freshmen, which starts with identity, sense of self, moves out to self and other relationships and empathy, moves out further to an individual's position in the community, what, the, what they can do for the community and what the community does for them, and, and then developing reasonable policy around this. Uh, it's, it's entitled The Creative Mind, and this course is required of all freshmen, and it goes for, uh, for the entire first year that they're here. It really is intended to help their critical thinking and information literacy skills. When we got to policy this spring, certainly we had a plan on which policies we were going to cover, but with the number of school shootings and with the folks who were, who are, are the age of our freshman class being affected by this, this was obviously on their radar. And a lot of their responses were very emotional from both sides, which you've seen. I'm Representative Marsico, I like the way you, you frame this from both sides. And obviously the critical thinking that you're using to, to narrow this down to what are the issues. You, you called the Santa Fe uh, school a hardened target already, which, which is an issue that's on people's minds. You know, are, they, are they soft targets or hard targets? Uh, but when my students brought this up, I, I kind of took the leash off of what we were going to do this semester. And they wanted to do some research and present on this topic specifically. And I said, go ahead. And the debate started very emotionally from both sides, whether they were pro-Second Amendment or whether they were uh, pro-strict uh, gun legislation. And so it started with, you know, and they're, they're 18, 19 years old. And of course, they're going to start with, with very impassioned positions on this, but what they ended up with was a look at from, and, and I encourage this, what would, well, let's look at science. This is a science and technology university. Let's look at the data. Let's do some research and look at where these issues are. And you, I, obviously you're al already doing that. Um, but I would encourage you to look at not just the data that's coming to you, but actually to go out and find the experts in these fields, whether it's neuropsychology, or social sciences, uh, scientific experts. And because the people who are coming to you often are those who have an agenda, who have a bias. But I've seen, you know, I, I practiced law in this county for 20 years, and I've seen trial lawyers go out and find the experts in the world who can inform you and help guide you. And why not do that? 
why not form a commission to go out and find these experts who will help you narrow these issues? When you have 320 million legal guns in this country and you see how many are responsible, how many of those guns are in the hands of those responsible for these acts, you know it's statistically very tiny. And yet it, 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 it impassions us because of the evil involved in it. Um, that's a word that's not used so often nowadays because we don't, in today's scientific-minded world, we don't, we don't look at evil incarnate, but I asked my uh, philosophy class one time to define evil, and they said, well, they, this is after a semester of thinking about it and doing some readings on it and whatnot, and they said, well, it really comes down to the intentional harming of the innocent. And, you know, whether that be children or whether that be animals who can't protect themselves or whatever. And so I... I take that and I look at it, and that's really the difference between the, the, the dramatics such as this volcano that we're looking at in Hawaii that's really not going to affect that many people, or the difference between something that on a large scale really does kill. If we were going to take away those kinds of threats, the automobile would have been banned a long time ago. But we still make efforts to carve out narrow safety exceptions to free speech, and in this case perhaps to the Second Amendment. And while it's important to protect the Second Amendment, it's also important for us to perhaps look at the science and the data that would really help us narrow down why are the folks who are doing this doing what they're doing. Uh, and, and that's why I say look at the experts, the neuropsychologists. You're already looking at somebody, you know, you're saying that this, the, the shooter in Santa Fe did not have any kind of flags go up. I was speaking to a, a, a grade school administrator recently who said that when they identify issues with students, they have to go to the parents to have them release, just to, just to sign a release, just to have them look at uh, the student and to be evaluated, diagnosed, and treated. And if they don't sign off on that because of the stigma, perhaps, of their child being labeled as having a mental health issue, then there's nothing the school administrator can do about it. And that kind of clear behavioral issue that led to this is also leading to their separation from their fellow students. And, that, and, and then we bring in the whole issue of bullying, which has come up in a lot of these school shootings. This is obviously a, a multi-pronged issue. It's not just related to firearms, it's related to mental health, uh, and it's related to, to things that I think science and data and research can help you with. Uh, I encourage you to do that, to look at that, that data, to go find the experts in this rather than just have folks come to you. There are many folks in this auditorium today who would like to come to you and give you all the statistics that they could. Um, for instance, the, you know, one of my students found the inverse correlation between legal gun ownership and gun violence. And I looked at the students who want some serious gun legislation. I said, how can you argue against this? And they said, we can't. But then I looked at them and the other side and I said, how can you argue against trying to do the hard, hard research and work to go find the experts to tell you who, how can we craft some minimal exception to the Second Amendment that's actually, actually going to make a difference? I mean, imagine a world where, where those who are in support of the Second Amendment actually want to look for this narrow exception to help the other side, to empathize with the other side. And, and those who want some kind of gun legislation to actually look at themselves and say, we need to keep this as narrow as possible because we understand what the other side is doing. Uh, again, I'm, I'm, I keep reiterating and I'm gonna end my remarks now to look at the science of this. Uh, I have a colleague who's encouraged me to, uh, uh, to ask you to look for developing a culture of responsibility when it comes to firearms. You know, when parents, for whatever reason, are allowing their children to take their firearms and do something, there isn't that culture of responsibility. So, thank you for coming here, and uh, if you have any questions. Well, thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, any questions, members? Members of Jawsby Act for a question? Oh, thank you. Good morning. Thanks. Thanks for your testimony. Uh, you hit on a subject that I think is important. You mentioned about uh, 
uh, it's not just a gun issue, it's a mental health issue. So as we've been hearing some of these hearings, uh, I'm, I'm becoming of the opinion that with the HIPAA rules today, that is, a, that is an issue that prevents people who know somebody is disturbed or prevented from, from letting law enforcement know about it, unless they're gonna absolutely say, I'm gonna go out there and shoot somebody. So what do you think we can do with the HIPAA rules? Can we get those relaxed on the federal level? So we, we have policy in place that prevents us from developing policy that will help us with to prevent these gun shootings. Yes, I, I think we should. Uh, if there's policy that keeps us from looking at those who may be a threat, I mean, what, what, the, the man who shot up the school in Florida, I mean, how many times had he been in touch, engaged with uh, those who have been reporting him, with law enforcement, and I, I think at some point, especially after the fact, I mean, if, if, if somebody has committed an act, if somebody has engaged with the Secret Service and is on their radar and done some illegal act, perhaps that's where you carve it out, where you say, uh, we need an exception here so that we can just open this up and study it. Study each of these people who have committed these crimes, these heinous crimes, and say, what, let's look at everything about them. Are they on psychoactive drugs, pharmaceuticals? Are they, have they been treated? Have they been diagnosed? Have they not, and why? What is their relationship with their fellow students? Or what was it? These need to be done as case studies by those who know how to do a case study and compare the data. Again, this is a very narrow, the monster within us is a very narrow, small group compared to all of society, and yet it's, it's forged in society too. Any other questions? Seeing none, well, thank you, Professor. Appreciate your time. Next to tes testify is Shara Goodman, Ceasefire PA. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Marsico, Chairman Petrarca, members of the committee for holding these hearings and the hearings in April. Uh, my name is Shara Goodman. I'm the Executive Director of Ceasefire PA. We are a statewide gun violence prevention organization. Uh, we work with mayors, police chiefs, faith leaders, community organizations, and individual Pennsylvanians to take a stand against gun violence. I submitted lengthy testimony, which I will not read, um, but I will hit on a couple key points, if I may, and then take questions. Um, I would also like to say, and, and this may surprise some of the folks in the room, uh, that despite um, what the professor said, I actually think you have called on many of the experts. Although I don't always agree with Mr. Prince and Mr. Stolfer, I hope that they would say the same, that we are experts all on this issue and can give you a lot of the data that you need um, and some of the people that you have called today. I think between the, the hours of hearings you had in April and the hours you're taking today, you have good bills in front of you that accomplish what the chairman asked for, which is how can we address the issue of gun violence and gun deaths in Pennsylvania while respecting what is a robust right to bear arms in this state? You have some several good bills have been introduced by members of this committee, by your colleagues in the Senate and the House, and many of you have signed on. And so I think that we can achieve that, and I would urge you um, that we don't need another commission. You've had commissions, you've had hearings. It's time to look at these bills and take votes and send them to your colleagues in the House. So just for a little bit of context, in 2015 in Pennsylvania, there were 1,485 firearm deaths. 533 were homicides and 932 were suicides. I know that it came up in the April hearings that some people believe it's not fair or it's somehow misleading to include suicide deaths when we talk about gun violence. I actually disagree with that and will tell you why. Guns are lethal, as you know, and suicides that are attempted by firearms are much more likely to be fatal than attempts by other means. Put simply, those who use firearms in suicide attempts have a much lower chance of survival. Approximately 85% of attempted firearm suicides result in death. Second, the accessibility of guns in the United States facilitates firearm suicide. And we know that access to a, easy access to a firearm, firearms in the home actually increase the risk factors for suicide. And the decision and the action of suicide are often impulsive. A quarter of survivors of suicide attempts 
report later that they made their attempt within five minutes of their decision to do so, half did so within 20 minutes, and three quarters within an hour. So I firmly believe, as do many of my colleagues testifying today, that we need to account for those suicide deaths when we talk about gun violence in Pennsylvania. We also need to talk about domestic violence. We also need to talk about accidental shootings. We also need to talk about crime that plagues many of our cities. Men in Pennsylvania are much more likely to die by guns than women, and black and white men experience firearm deaths in very different ways. Middle-aged white men who live in rural and suburban areas in Pennsylvania are much more likely to die by firearm in a suicide, while younger African-American men who live in our urban areas are much more likely to die in homicide. All of which is to say that we have a problem, which you've recognized, and we need to address it. We also have, as I said early, a very robust and strong right to bear arms. We have a system that does not require license or registration prior to purchase. There's no waiting period prior to purchase. There's no training requirement to purchase. There's no limit on the number of firearms and the amount of ammunition you may purchase. We have open carry without a license, except in Philadelphia. There's a relatively permissive process for obtaining a concealed carry license. We have no child access prevention laws, no safe storage requirements. We don't require an owner to report if his or her gun goes missing. And we allow the private sale of long guns without a background check. There are gaps here that we could address to deal with and to reduce the level of gun violence and gun deaths we experience. There's some key policies that we outlined in our testimony that we would urge you to look very strongly at and to vote out of this committee. The first is what's known as an emergency risk protection order. I believe it was introduced by member Todd Stevens and signed on by many of the members of this committee. It's also known as a red flag bill. We've been talking about this bill for a number of years. Um, it's gotten a lot more attention since the Parkland shooting, and I believe that three states have actually enacted it since the Parkland shooting. This addresses part of the problem that you, Representative Joswiak, just asked about. What do you do when a mental health professional doesn't, it doesn't rise to the level of a mandatory reporting, but somebody knows that something is wrong, that somebody is in crisis? This creates a civil process, very much modeled on our um, temporary restraining order process in the domestic violence context, where somebody who would not yet be prohibited because of their mental health history could temporarily, temporarily be blocked from getting a gun or temporarily have guns removed. We don't have anything like that right now. So right now in Pennsylvania, if your mental health history has lived into the, uh, risen to the level of an involuntary commitment or being declared incompetent, you lose your gun rights permanently. Now many of those people will never become a harm to themselves or others, and they've now lost their rights permanently. So you may be surprised to know, but Representative Stevens can tell you that Ceasefire PA has worked with him in the past on how do we get those rights restored. On the other hand, it's under-inclusive. What about the young man who comes back from college having failed classes, having a bad romantic relationship, feels like everything is spinning out of control, but has never been to a therapist, has never been to a guidance counselor, has not been declared incompetent, but somebody knows something is wrong. And this person, there are guns in the home, or he can go buy a gun. He may be a very much in danger to himself or others. I met a father in Allentown that this exact situation happened to. His young son came home, told his father he was in crisis. They made a, an appointment to go together to a therapist that afternoon. By the time the father got home from work, the young man had gone to a gun store, bought a handgun, and shot himself. You don't get a second chance. We could do something about that. The states that have enacted this law have found it works not only to prevent homicides or mass shootings or murder-suicides, but especially to prevent suicides. Connecticut has had a law in place like this for years. Uh, they allow law enforcement to do this. It has prevented suicides. I have a lot of data on that in my, in my paper. If we can do something that works, that is proven to work, we should do that. And again, it is temporary. People can get their gun rights back, which is important. It is a right that we should not take away forever. People can get the help they need. People can get through a crisis and should be able to resume their normal life. I would encourage you to look at that bill. It has bipartisan support. A lot of states are doing it. There's good data to support it. Um, I think it's exactly the kind of bill that Chairman Marsico was asking for. The Senate has passed out Senate Bill 501 in the domestic violence context unanimously. Um, I don't know about other areas, but it's rare that a firearms and domestic violence related bill pass unanimously from this body. So what that does is it requires surrender of firearms 
when permanent protection from abuse orders are issued. Now, we all know that under federal law, if you have a final protection from abuse order, you're not supposed to be able to buy a firearm. But there is no uh, good procedure in place for making sure, if a judge hasn't ordered it, that you don't have access to a firearm in your home already. This closes that loophole. It would also make surrender mandatory, and within 48 hours, not 60 days as we currently have it, it protects victims, and importantly, it protects law enforcement officers who know that the most dangerous time is after an, an order has been served. I think, although I, I think Mr. Prince may disagree with me, uh, that most people in this room believe that there are some people who have forfeited their firearms rights, including domestic abusers. This keeps guns away from the hands of people we have already identified as dangerous. We have a background check system in Pennsylvania that's working very well. Unlike many states, it requires background checks for the private sale of handguns. And we're a point of contact state, so we have PICS, which I know is often under attack. But I have also read the testimony every year from the Pennsylvania State Police who continue to say that they have more records than the NICS database, that uh, they use it for more things, that the Charleston loophole that allowed the shooter at the AME Church to get his gun would not have happened here in Pennsylvania. And so I urge you to maintain the PICS system, and I urge you to consider House Bill 1400, which extends background checks to the private sale of long guns. I would also urge you, because I know that this has come up a lot in the wake of the school shootings, to look at ways to make our kids safer that do not involve introducing more guns into our schools. I know that the Senate has passed Senate Bill 383. It was a tightly fought bill. Teachers opposed it, parents opposed it, students opposed it, um, teachers unions opposed it, many administrators opposed it. Very few people think that arming non-security personnel in schools will make our schools safer, and in fact, a joint state government task force after Sandy Hook found the same exact thing. So I urge you not to be reactionary and say that is the way to go. We should have more money for our schools. If they want armed officers, school resource officers, or security guards, they should be able to make that decision at the local level. We should look at uh, security assessments. There should be funding to do that. But uh, we also need to look at how do we keep guns from the hands of those people that we've identified are likely to harm themselves or others. One way we also know, and it was alluded to earlier, often these children or young people who shoot up their schools got the guns at home. Do we have child access prevention laws? Are adults being held accountable? Do adults who know that the children in their lives are in crisis have an obligation to temporarily remove those guns? We need to look at the adults as well. In the last five years that I've worked at Ceasefire PA, I think I've been invited twice to testify before this committee. Once was July of 2013 following Sandy Hook. I sat with Francine Wheeler and Nicole Hockley, who are two parents who lost their children there. There wasn't a dry eye here. Since that time, this House and the Senate have passed mandatory minimum bills. You've passed preemption to uh, allow gun groups to sue cities who try and do their own things. You have held hearings on those mandatory minimum bills and sentencing enhancements, which we know do not deter further actions, but are about punitive, and, and people have varying views on those. I think it's time for you to take action on some of these bills. I could have come here and said, we need license and registration, we need to ban assault weapons, we need to ban high capacity magazines, we need to do all those things. Instead, I talked to you about bipartisan bills compromise bills that I think we can work on with gun owners, with those who would protect gun rights, and get something done to save lives in Pennsylvania. It has been five years. I was on leave of absence. I was supposed to not be working this week. After Friday in Santa Fe, I was so angry. I demanded that I would testify. I came back on the payroll to do this. You have the opportunity. Right after Sandy Hook, I met Mrs. Casey, and she told me that she said to the senator, you're one of 100 people who can do something. You're 27 people out of 203 who can do something, and I urge you to take a vote, to come together, to find ways to do it, to save lives in Pennsylvania. Thank you. Questions? Comments? I have one question. Representative Barbin. Um, thank you for your testimony. The one thing that I didn't hear of when you were suggesting the bills that we could vote on a bipartisan basis was 
in the school context, what should we be doing to um, identify mental health illness as a possible start? Because what we ha have heard from our prior testimony was that there are HIPAA requirements that are interfering with that. That's a federal issue. We can't waive HIPAA at the state level. What is it that we can do to make a short-term benefit to public school safety on the mental illness front? So thank you. I do, I do want to again point out that those living with mental illness are much more likely to become victims of violence than perpetrators. And I know it often gets conflated um, that, that it's a mental illness issue. And especially in these school shootings, people, there always seems to be somebody knew something somebody had gotten some kind of treatment or somebody had been identified as a problem but hadn't gotten the treatment. So I think part of it is HIPAA. I think these extreme risk protection order bills, I think the bill as drafted here talks about parents and family members and law enforcement. I know that there are suggestions that guidance counselors be uh, included. I, don't, I do not know uh, how that impacts the rules of reporting. Um, that those people and therapists and, and licensees are already charged with. I think we'd have to look at that because certainly psychologists and psychiatrists have rules when they are supposed to report, but this might not lead to that level, right, because of the HIPAA rules and the oath of, the, of treatment. But I think we should look at those HIPAA rules and opening them up and, and making sure that people who know something can say something. But there are others besides the people bound by those rules who often know things. That could be parents, that could be teachers who are not still bound by HIPAA. That could be friends, um, family members, coworkers. Th those people don't have the same HIPAA obligations. So I think it's worth looking at, but I also think um, there are ways uh, we can look at what other states have done and who they allow as reporters in these extreme risk protection order um, bills. Representative Sacon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your testimony. I encourage everyone that's testifying today, I hope you stay long enough to hear both sides of the arguments, because oftentimes we don't, we get the advantage of hearing both sides, but oftentimes I see testifiers leaving and they don't hear the other side, and that's the whole point of this, is so we can hear each other's point of view. Um, and, and I know we're going to hear testimony, I know what you said about the PIC system, but I'm sure we're going to hear testimony later about why the PIC system really isn't working and, and why we need to either make changes or, or, or opt out of that. I also just want to add briefly that uh, I am a teacher. I've been stood in, stood in front of a classroom now for two decades. I'm fully trained in firearms use. I've used it in law enforcement and in the military. I've carried a weapon in harm's way. Wouldn't you like a person like me in a classroom to be there to defend people when it's going to take 10, 15 minutes for police to arrive, or you have three sheriffs standing outside as we had that incident doing nothing while people inside are being killed? Uh, I think it's the option of having teachers armed is a, is a viable option, uh, it's op and, and it is an option. Uh, it could be an option. So I think we need to consider those, uh, those aspects of it. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Representative Sacone. Um I appreciate your service as a teacher and as a representative. And you know, I know personally from our conversations how trained you are. Uh, I have grave concerns about the bills in their current form that do not seem to require ongoing training, safe storage, um, who explain who would be allowed to do that. And I, I worry about the average math teacher who's teaching my kids who may also have a gun. We've also seen even one of the Parkland teachers who was carrying a gun left his gun unsecured in a public bathroom and uh, somebody found it and shot and both of them are, thankfully nobody was hurt, but both of them are you know, being charged. So I think that there's a lot of danger fraught in there and although I believe that there are many people who are well-trained law-abiding gun owners who I probably would feel very safe around, I'm not sure that that includes the vast majority of our teachers. Representative Dean. Thank you, Chairman, uh, for hosting last month's hearings and, and today's hearings. And thank you, Sheriff, for your service and your advocacy. Uh, I wanted to touch on just two things uh, quickly. Um, but before I do that, in terms of arming teachers, it, my, my basic comment there is uh, regardless of, of the expertise of, of a Representative Saccone, uh, I'm a mom, I'm a grandmom, uh, and I think we ask so much more of our kids in terms of the fear that they have to invest in themselves every day. Do we want to add to that that your teachers are armed, they're ready, they have guns, or I don't know where their guns are. Uh, we ask so much of our teachers every day. 
uh, while we don't fully, fully support them, are we really asking our teachers to uh, now, in addition to making sure you know your area of discipline, uh, whether it's mathematics or science or literature, uh, make sure you go to the gun range and be ready to shoot up a classroom. Uh, it's an absurdity I'll never understand. Um, the two things that you talked about, and I was interested if you could um, give us a little more detail on this, the emergency risk protection order, uh, and I was thinking about it in terms of the background check system, and you were talking about the Charleston loophole. Sadly, tragically, the Charleston case reveals both of those, because I believe the shooter in Charleston uh, folks, friends knew he was in grave danger, had not been 302'd, had not had a mental health history, but they knew he was in grave danger. Can you speak to that, how sadly that case reflects um, the, the value of both of these systems? Uh, and then the other piece of it is, much of this talks about, um, of course, these horrific mass shootings that we now see are on the increase. What do you think is the most important thing we should do uh, regarding the day-to-day -day loss of life? Thank you um, for, for all those questions, Representative Dean. Uh, first, I, I agree about the teachers. Um, and, you know, we did have a, a letter that was read on the Senate floor from teachers at Sandy Hook who said this would have been the last thing they wanted that horrible day in 2012 to, was to have guns in that classroom. Um, second, as to the background check system, the, the Charleston loophole under federal law, if, um, if a, a clear no does not come back from the background check system. The seller has the option after three days to proceed with the sale. That's called a default proceed. Uh, Pennsylvania, the PIC system does not allow that. They have a 15-day process where they wait for a clear yes, and then there is also an appeals process. Um, so in the Charleston case, he had a, a gun, run his background check and a prior um, prior prohibiting information had not gotten back in time to the seller and a default proceed occurred. He did have a friend who noticed that he was behaving erratically, strangely, talking in a dangerous way and took his gun away temporarily and then worried that he would be in trouble for having the gun, for having taken the gun. Uh, under the extreme risk protection order bills, I think, uh, and Representative Stevens, please correct me, I think it's more about direct family members. Um, I'm not sure if a friend would have been able to do that, but it, the, the bills were modeled after the Santa Barbara shooting. Uh, if you remember that, uh, that, that was a shoot, young man on campus, had shot up part of his campus, then, then hit some people with a car, then shot himself. His parents actually had called the police uh, for a wall check on their son. Uh, they didn't have enough evidence to take him into custody or to commit him. And a few weeks later, he did commit that shooting. This would have, um, this would have been a different procedure that those parents could have used. They could have gone through the civil procedure, gotten him on a no-buy list, and temporarily removed his firearms. Um, the third question about what do we do about um, everyday shootings. Um, we have a lot of guns. We have loopholes in the system that make it easy to get a gun for people who shouldn't. We, in 2012, you passed the Brad Fox law that makes uh, punishments for straw purchasers tougher, and I think that's been to good effect, and that's important. Um, I think we should be tracing our crime guns. We should know where they come from. Some of that is done between the ATF and local jurisdictions, but the information isn't shared. So, for example, I'm sure you've heard that the governor of New Jersey has been blaming Pennsylvania for all of our crime guns that end up at New Jersey scenes because they are mapping where their guns are traveling. It would be good to know how far are our crime guns traveling geographically, how long to, to from from the time the last legal purchase to the to the time of crime. How long are they out there? Who is getting them? How are they moving? Are there certain bad dealers? I, I've asked um, the governor's office, I've asked the attorney general to do some of that mapping to get that data public so that we would have data exactly as the professor suggested so that we would know where to focus resources and policies. Representative Jaws, do you have a question? Yes, sir. Okay, go ahead. Chairman. I have two questions. Um, I have a problem with the red flag bill. There's no due process here for people. Uh, you can, the police just walk in. I'm a former law enforcement officer, so police just walk in, take the guy's guns or the woman's, and it's temporary, which is one year. So what happens to the guy or the person that they're taking the guns from when they remove his guns? What what's the process with that person? So 
my understanding, sir, and again, I think Representative Stevens is the author of, of one of these bills, is it, it, the police officers can't just go in and take the guns. There has to be a petition to a court with evidence presented um, that may or may not be ex parte. If it's ex parte, it would only be, I think, I think that Representative Stevens' bill is about 10 days. Some of them go as far as three weeks. And then both sides would come in and petition for either an extension of the order or a, return, a, a relinquishment of the order and a return of the firearms. Um, we do this in the temporary uh, restraining order process when we believe somebody's a danger to themselves or others. I don't think that that system is abused any more than there's other false reporting of crimes or uh, accusations made. I think that this is a serious situation that um, Connecticut has found has identified people at risk of suicide, has found at risk, uh, had when they've re removed guns, they found people had about seven guns in their home um, and it has prevented some suicide attempts. Um, I, I, you know, I would ask Representative Stevens if he wants to comment on the other due process protections. And I think, unlike many of the other bills, I'll just add that Representative Stevens has a, a provision for uh, a public defender, so somebody would be represented free of free of charge. Representative Stevens, uh, do you want to explain your bill? Sure, <laughs> sure, Mr. Chairman. Um, as um, as Shira indicated, the bill has a number of due process protections um, built in, but she's exactly right in that the police are not going to make this decision unilaterally. A, uh, a law enforcement member or family member would need to petition a judge um, and provide information um, indicating that an individual is a threat to themselves or others, and only upon reviewing that information would a judge be able to issue an order to temporarily um, force someone to surrender their guns. Um, and then they'll get a full hearing. And we actually, in the bill, and, and certainly there's an opportunity for amendments, and we're going to be, um, we've heard a lot of feedback, and we are making some, uh, some changes to the bill as it's currently written uh, to incorporate many of the thoughts and, and really careful considerations that many groups have provided. Um, but one of the things that we are, um, we are working to do is we were aware that there were some concerns that uh, if an individual was the subject of one of these orders, um, if a hearing, we wanted to provide a quick hearing, and so um, we do put a, a pretty short time frame in there where they're guaranteed to have a hearing. And we actually even have in the bill that um, the hearing can't be continued without their consent because there was a concern that um, the respondent might not have um, ample opportunity to uh, go ahead if they wanted to have a psychiatric evaluation or present evidence or gather witnesses, things like that. Um, and so we really, um, we really tilted the landscape in terms of these rights, in terms of the, uh, the timing towards the respondent and gave them more authority uh, in the timing of that, um, that ultimate hearing. And at that hearing, again, they would have the right uh, to counsel. Unlike many other states, I actually uh, included in the bill that the Public Defender's Office would, um, would represent this individual if they could not afford an attorney. Um, the petitioner also uh, has the right to counsel, and um, the, the District Attorney's Office would have the option of helping out in that regard. Um, my thought there was that I wanted both people to have the opportunity to have legal representation participate in the proceedings on their behalf. Again, both the petitioner and the respondent. Um, you know, they certainly are going to be given the opportunity to cross-examine witnesses, present any evidence they would like, um, and then obviously the judge would make a, a determination. And that, um, that order then um, to surrender their guns would last for no more than a year. Um, again, this is a temporary, uh, a temporary um, provision to address a temporary condition. And, you know, when I compare and contrast that with the current 302 process, which is really devoid of any due process protections, um, we tried to make sure that we built into this bill um, as much due process as, as we could really possibly fit into the bill. If anybody has other suggestions for additional due process you know, protections or provisions, we're happy to uh, incorporate them. But when you look at the current 302 provision, which, again, acts as a bar for life um, with almost no due process protections, um, this has significant due process protections and at most would deprive you of guns for a year. So nobody really answered my question. My question was, if you take these weapons from a person, what do you do with the person? Is there anything in the bill that says a person has to go to a doctor or anything that treats this person? If you're going to take his weapons for a year, are you just going to let him hang out there to go buy one somewhere else? 
Well, I'm sorry, I misunderstood the question. Um, my understanding is that he's not, you're not just taking their weapons, but they would be on a prohibited purchaser list for that time period, um, so in picks and nicks. Um, and the evidence has showed a lot of those people do get into treatment voluntarily. They do get help that they needed. Some of them were never identified to the system before. Um, I think that is, is in part up to, I don't think the judge makes that order, uh, but I believe it's the family has the ability and more flexibility to, to help deal with their, their family member. If I could just jump in there, um, you know, one of the things that Shira pointed out was the significant data about the short time frame in which people make the decision to take their own life. And, and this bill is really um, mostly about suicide. I mean, two thirds of all gun deaths are suicides. And so um, the idea is you give folks a little bit of time and space and then they can go get the help that they need in order to address their situation. So they can go see a psychologist, they can go see a psychiatrist, they can go um, you know, obtain the services that are crucial for them and they no longer have the ability to make that impulsive and irreversible decision to take their own life with that firearm. And that's really the key. So the other question I have with that is, what's the process then after a year for this person to re get their firearms back? So we were also mindful of that. And when we were developing the bill, one of the things that um, uh, someone uh, from the gun rights advocacy side of the equation had presented to me was, um, all too often, it's too difficult for folks to get their firearms back. And so we wanted to make it an automatic process. Upon the expiration, you know, it's not like you have to then file another petition to get your firearms back or anything else like that. You would simply go to the agency who has your weapons. They would have to run, you know, run a criminal history, run a background check uh, before giving your firearms back. Um, but it would be done uh, automatically um, without the need for any additional legal proceedings or anything else like that. We were mindful of that. And if you or anyone else have any suggestions on how we can streamline that process, we're happy to uh, consider them and uh, incorporate them into the bill. Yeah, I know when I was uh, the sheriff of the county, every time we uh, collected somebody's weapons, they had to get court orders. It turned out to cost more for attorneys than the weapons were worth, uh, unless they had a lot of them. And it just was a big roadblock in them getting their, their, getting their weapons back. Um, the second thing I wanted to talk about real briefly is um, I have to agree with you on the PICS system. Uh, the PIC system in Pennsylvania is working. Um, there's a lot of flaws with the federal system. I know the federal system wants Pennsylvania to be the point of contact. PIC system checks 14 data, approximately 14 databases. Uh, the feds do not. Uh, what, what I'm finding out is uh, I've heard a lot of discussion about um, every time there's a gun show or a major gun event that the PICS is out of service, they're down. Well. Last year, the PICS was only down 67 hours. They weren't down every weekend like, like people are telling me. Um, and I do like the 15-day yes or no answer rather than a three-day federal answer, which means if they don't get an answer, they give, you the, they give you the approval, and if they find out later you shouldn't have a gun, who goes and gets it? The law enforcement officer has to now go after some bad guy, and that's a risk. And I would rather be sure one way or the other that they have it. So in my opinion, the PIC system is working and I think that should never go away. Thank you. Well, thank you, sir. And since I'm a lawyer by training, I know when the judge agrees with something you've said, you say thank you. Well, thank you, Sheriff. Appreciate your time and your testimony. Before I uh, introduce the next uh, testifiers, I want to recognize Representative Briggs and Representative Delosier who are we're here. The next testifier is Joshua Prince, Esquire Firearms Industry Consulting Group, and also Adam Kraut, Esquire Firearms Industry Consulting Group. Good morning, gentlemen. You may begin. Mr. Chairman, honorable members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and discuss these important issues along with my colleague, Attorney Adam Kraut. I'm a licensed member in good standing of the Pennsylvania and Maryland Bar and admitted to numerous courts, including the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third and Sixth Circuit Courts, and the District Courts for the Eastern, Middle, and Western of Pennsylvania. As my curriculum vitae is beyond the scope of my testimony today, I have attached it as Exhibit A to my testimony. Due to the extensive nature of these bills pending, the voluminous constitutional and legal issues with them and the extremely limited amount of time that 
we have been provided to address these issues here today, attached to my testimony as Exhibit H is a review of each bill and the constitutional and legal issues that relate thereto. As there are a plethora of unconstitutional provisions pursuant to the United States and Pennsylvania constitutions in the pending bills, I believe it necessary to start by reciting the oath that every member of the General Assembly is required to affirm pursuant to Article 6, Section 3. And I quote, I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support, obey, and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of this Commonwealth, and that I will discharge the duties of my office with fidelity. Article 6, Section 3 then goes on to declare that, quote, any person refusing to take the oath or affirmation shall forfeit his office. Yet we see numerous bills being offered with no consideration for the lack of due process, takings without just compensation, and unconstitutional delegations of authority, let alone the right to keep and bear arms, all of which are made inviolate by Article 1, Section 25. Let me emphasize that. All of those rights are made inviolate by Article 1, Section 25 of the Pennsylvania Constitution as ratified by the citizens of this Commonwealth. Worse yet, we see Governor Wolf and Re Republican members of the General Assembly discriminating against those with closely held religious beliefs, such as the Amish, by seeking to preclude their ability to purchase firearms and ammunition through proposals such as House Bills 1400, 2249, and 2251. Instead of seeking to restrict law-abiding individuals' rights, why isn't the General Assembly proposing and considering true common sense proposals? Why haven't we enacted a law that further codifies the right of school personnel to possess firearms, electronic incapacitation devices, and non-lethal weapons in assuring the protection of our children, like Israel has done since its inception? Professor Eric Dietz of Purdue University, whose Homeland Defense Institute examined school shootings and compiled a report, determined that armed staff and personnel are essential to mitigate the dangers of an active shooter. While Senate Bill 383 was a decent attempt, it suffers from major flaws, which is why I have drafted an amendment to it that would address all the concerns while ensuring the confidentiality of those school personnel who are armed. A copy is attached as Exhibit B. Why hasn't this committee taken action on Senate Bill 5, which has been pending in this committee since April 26th of 2017, when municipalities are flagrantly violating state preemption, which constitutes a misdemeanor of the first degree? How can this committee condone these acts and not take action, especially when seven individuals were prosecuted under an unlawful ordinance of the city of Erie, and as a result, incurred thousands of dollars of legal fees with no right to reimbursement. Why haven't we enacted a law that requires notification by the Pennsylvania State Police when a person becomes prohibited from purchasing and possessing firearms and ammunition under state or federal law? If our goal is to ensure that prohibited individuals are not even attempting to obtain firearms and ammunition, I cannot fathom how, regardless of political affiliation, the members of the General Assembly cannot pass such a common sense proposal. For this reason, I have drafted a proposed bill that is attached as Exhibit C. Why haven't we revised Section 6105F to come into compliance with the Nix Improvement Amendments Act in relation to mental health commitments where Pennsylvania would be entitled to millions of dollars in federal funds for our compliance. A draft proposal is attached as Exhibit D. Why haven't we amended Section 6105.1 to provide for relief from disabilities 
from, of, uh, for misdemeanor offenses, especially in light of the Third Circuit's en banc decision in Binderup versus Attorney General of the United States, where the court held that such prohibitions can violate an individual's Second Amendment rights. A draft proposal is attached as Exhibit E. Why haven't we provided the Pennsylvania State Police with the authority to issue legal determinations under the Uniform Firearms Act like we have in relation to the Liquor Control Board laws so that individuals can ensure their compliance with the law? A draft proposal is attached as Exhibit F. If you want to talk about bills that actually protect the public and law-abiding citizen, then these are the bills we should be discussing. More importantly, if you believe individuals who have been adjudicated incompetent, committed to a mental institution, or convicted of a crime punishable by more than one year are such a threat to our society to warrant deprivation of a constitutional right in perpetuity, why haven't you proposed a law that would likewise prohibit those same individuals from being able to vote or from becoming reporters or members of the General Assembly? We have youth that believe eating Tide Pods is an acceptable and safe after-school activity and a small number of people who knowingly break the law to commit crime, yet we're here discussing proposals on how to further restrict law-abiding citizens' constitutional rights rather than address the underlying issues. In closing, an attack on the right to keep and bear arms of law-abiding citizens is an attack on our republic and our founding constitutional agreement. As written by Thomas Jefferson, the laws that forbid the carrying of arms are laws of such a nature. They disarm only those who are neither inclined nor committed to commit crimes. Such laws make things worse for the assaulted and better for the assailants. They serve rather to encourage than to prevent homicide for an unarmed man may be attacked with greater confidence than an armed man. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify before you today. I will now turn it over to Attorney Kraut. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, honorable members of the committee. Uh, when these hearings were first initially announced, I was quite frankly a little disappointed to see it only included House members. Uh, however, I am grateful to be here and I am glad you extended the opportunity to allow uh, public testimony on the matter here. Uh, I, like my colleague, Mr. Prince, I'm a licensed member in good standing of a variety of courts, including the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, as well as numerous federal courts. I won't bore you with those details. A copy of my uh, curriculum is also in Exhibit A. Uh, while in law school through October of last year, I was also the general manager of a gun store. So I see this debate from a variety of perspectives, both as a lawyer, having had time behind the counter, uh, during my three years behind the counter there, I interacted with people from all walks of life, law enforcement officials, as well as ATF. My experience allows me to see the gun debate from a variety of perspectives. That includes the first time gun buyer, somebody who's never owned a gun before, coming in for whatever that reason may be, to the law enforcement official who's coming in on official business. It seems that there's a fundamental misunderstanding that many members of the General Assembly and the public have when it comes to firearms and firearms rights. The right to keep and bear arms is not granted by the federal or state constitutions. It's a pre-existing natural right, and that recording of which can be traced back to 13th century England in the Magna Carta. The purpose of the Second Amendment in Article 1, Section 21, is to ensure that the government doesn't infringe upon this pre-existing right. While the Second Amendment's often quoted and debated as to its meaning, that, and some people like to believe that there is no individual right, even though the United States Supreme Court has said otherwise, Article 1, Section 21 makes it explicitly clear. The right of the citizens to bear arms in defense of themselves and the state shall not be questioned. Looking through the bills that are in front of this committee, it would appear that a number of them violate our state constitution. For example, SB 17 seeks to deny citizens the right to assault weapons in high capacity magazines, all while violating a number of constitutional provisions including due process and the takings clauses. And let's be clear here, the term assault weapon is a term of art that was concocted in an attempt to confuse the public and garner support for the banning of a particular class of firearms. You see this Or Orwellian style newspeak being employed by various groups with the new buzz phrase, weapons of war. In addition to constitutional concerns, SB 17 will also deny people, especially those who are disabled or of limited size or skill, the ability to adequately defend themselves within their own homes. For some reason, the magic number with legislators is 10. No one needs more than 10 rounds to defend themselves is one of the hallmark battle cries of those seeking to tighten restrictions. Yet, there's plenty of reasons a person may need more than 10 rounds. 
we continue to see home invasions where there's multiple intruders. Uh, there are plenty of incidences that have been reported in the news, such as the woman down in Georgia who had three individuals break into her home at 4 a.m. All three of those individuals were armed. Perhaps the gentleman in Oklahoma who defended his home against three intruders during a home invasion with an AR-15 may make an interesting case study. Let's not forget the heroic 15-year-old who defended his 12-year-old sister in Texas with an AR-15 against two intruders. And then, maybe we should ask the woman who shot an intruder five times and did not fully incapacitate him. What if she had a gun that was limited to 10 rounds and faced multiple intruders? Would 10 have been enough for her? The practice of law has led me to see the gun debate through an even broader lens. I've had to inform countless clients that they're no longer able to own a firearm because of some nonviolent offense they committed decades ago. I've also had to advise individuals they'd likely be prosecuted for making purported false statements on the forms required to purchase a firearm, uh, all because they were never informed that at any point by pleading guilty to an offense, they would lose their right to keep and bear arms. It seems that uh, a number of attorneys, district attorneys, and even judges don't have any idea as to what offenses lead to the prohibition of somebody. Worse yet, the guilty plea colloquies don't inform people that they're actually going to lose their rights. And perhaps even more egregious, their options for relief are often limited, expensive, and offer no guarantee for the restoration of that right. Being stuck in such a position limits the ability of a person to choose a firearm for self-defense. Now, we've heard a lot of testimony this morning already, and I think there's one thing that we can probably all agree on in this room, regardless of where we sit on the gun issue, and that's the protection of our children. If that's the case, then why are we not doing things like allowing teachers and administrative staff and school resource officers to be armed who wish to do so? I'm not saying we should mandate it because I understand that people may not be comfortable with that. Why are we not making schools hardened facilities? Is this just merely because it requires an answer we don't like even though it may be the best answer? And why are we not teaching firearms education in schools anymore? We teach our children about sex and we teach our children about drugs because we as adults understand that kids are going to engage in those activities whether we want them to or not. But we give them the skills and the tools to make informed decisions about that. Why are we not teaching kids how to handle guns safely? So if they find themselves in a situation where one is, they have the skills and knowledge set to act appropriately and leave the situation safely. Before this committee stands a plethora of bills that have been drafted in an attempt to say we did something. These come at a time when emotions are high, and understandably so. However, this committee and the General Assembly should not advance legislation based merely on emotion. It should be cast, passed after careful debate based on logic and reasoning. Um, these are kind of outside of my prepared remarks here, but I did want to touch on a few things that other individuals had mentioned earlier. Uh, Mr. Folkrod had mentioned a culture of responsibility, and that seems to be something that is lost as a whole within our society. And I don't think that's anything that you can legislate back into it. I think that's going to have to start in the homes. And I think we as parents, as family members, we need to start instilling that into our, our communities, our families. Um, Mrs. Goodman had mentioned straw purchasing. Uh, that, I, I was at a um, NICS conference at uh, FBI's headquarters last summer, I believe it was. FBI prosecutes, or the, the U.S. attorneys prosecute approximately 1% of straw purchases across the board. 1%. It's illegal. There's a law against it. They don't get prosecuted. Um, we had an incident where there was a state trooper in the store. There was an individual who turned out to be prohibited, uh, let the trooper know, and the trooper kind of shrugged his shoulders, and out the door he went. Uh, picks being down at gun shows, I heard that was mentioned. I worked at a gun show. I was trying to find the picture because I took a screenshot of it. I must have called picks over the course of two and a half hours. I'd say at least 25 times before I was able to get to an operator, and then I sat on hold for another hour. So there are some issues with picks. I'll let Mr. Stolfer, I'm sure, is going to expand on that. Um, but uh, having experienced it, I just did want to let you know that there are some issues with picks. And Representative Stevens, your, your bill, um, you mentioned that there would be the automatic return of firearms upon the expiration. Um, part of the issue, to some degree, uh, I, I have other issues with your bill, but I, I don't know if you're aware. Part of the issue would be just the NICS being updated as to the person no longer being prohibited. That's not an instant process. Um, so, you know, if I, you told me today my order was up and I went to go get my stuff back, it's likely I would get denied. So 
Well, along those lines, I'd love to sit with you and, and come up with a solution to address that. Maybe it's um, submitting the information you know, in advance of the expiration of the order so that there's an opportunity for that to be entered or, or some other uh, solution. But I'm happy to work with you to, to try to ensure that those folks, upon the expiration of that order, are able to, uh, you know, uh, obtain their firearms again. Okay. I just wanted to make you aware of that issue. So, um, And I'll just leave you with this thought. The, uh, the laws you make are only going to be as good as the willingness of people to obey them. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, members, uh, please make sure your microphones are turned off. Um, when you're not speaking. So, uh, Attorney uh, Prince, uh, you had mentioned uh, in your comments and your written testimony about Senate Bill 5. Yep. Are you familiar with House Bill 671? I am. Okay, well, then it would have been good, it would have been good for you to mention that we did pass that bill out of this committee. Uh, twice, last session and this session, and then sitting in the Senate. In fact, that bill was in the Senate before Senate Bill 5 was even introduced. And, and House Bill 671 does not provide all the protections that Senate Bill 5 does, and it is not consistent with what was previously passed and held unconstitutional by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, not because of the context of the legislation, but the way in which it was added to a copper bill. Well, House Bill 671 are not sufficient. Senate Bill 5 does provide the requisite uh, protections, and I do address it in my uh, exhibit H. Okay. All right. Those. Okay. Didn't, didn't realize that, but you, you only mentioned Senate Bill 5. Correct, because I believe that's the only true answer currently pending. Yeah, well, that, that's a matter of your opinion. Yeah, right. right. Okay. Thanks. Um, so, Representative Dean, for question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and gentlemen, thanks for being here today and participating. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, number one, you are part of a consulting firm and you bill yourself as a firearms industry consulting group. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, firearms industry consulting group. Uh, I want to uh, dispel a myth that you cited, which is that these bills are brought up hastily uh, and in emotion. Uh, I'm sure there's deep emotion around this country uh, and in this room about the loss of life in this country from gun violence. But you need to know that these bills have been brought up session after session after session after session, many of them. So this is something that thoughtful legislators on both sides of the aisle have been trying to do for a long time. So my basic question is, what do you want to do to save some lives? That's a good question. Well, we can start by looking at what the problems are. It seems like a lot of people like to point to guns as being the issue. Um, we've heard mental health mentioned. Personal responsibility is another one. There's some things that you just can't legislate. You can't legislate the actions of an individual. You can impose penalties on them. We heard about mandatory minimums, things that are deterrent. That's the, some point of the law. Some of it's punitive. Some of it's from deterrent factors. But as far as what you can do... I would do, interrupt you and ask you to concretely tell this room that is eagerly awaiting your words, what do you want to do to save lives? You've quoted the Constitution sure. and the constitutional right to bear arms, both in Pennsylvania Constitution and the United States Constitution. Yes. Many of us on the other side of this honor the Second Amendment. That's not what this fight is all about. This is actually a fight about saving lives. What do you want to do to protect that other constitutional right, which is the right of life liberty and the pursuit of happiness. When our children are killed, <laughs> when our children are not safe walking into their school, when they are slaughtered as babies, when people going to church are no longer safe, when children in neighborhoods that are racked with poverty are also fearful of the guns they hear at night. What do you want to do to protect that right 
I mean it, specifically, concretely. Are you in favor of background checks? Should we close that loophole here in Pennsylvania? What loophole are you referring to? Are you talking about private, the private party sale? Sales? Can you point to a single example where a private party sale... No, wait sale a second. I'm no, asking, um, no, the question is from me to you, if you don't mind. You're okay, guys, hold on a second. Like I said earlier today in my introductory remarks, we want to have a civil, professional, respectful dialogue. And I'm hoping that you uh, listen to that again. And uh, I would rather not have applause either. Uh, I respect, I know it's a very emotional issue, but uh, let's, let's just calm down a little bit, okay? Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, you're absolutely right, and I apologize. I'll ask you just simply, specifically, concretely, what do you want to do to save lives? Thanks. Well, ma'am, it sounds like we have a little bit of a societal problem. You point to a couple of different places. You speak about inner cities, you speak about schools, you speak about churches, and we talk about individuals who come that have problems, right? We can start by talking about schools, if you would like. You know, schools currently, most of them, uh, and it's been a while since I've been to a, a grade school or a high school, so bear with me here. I know when I was in high school, anybody was able to just walk into the school. I know shortly after I left high school, they started to do things like locking the front door at least, and if you were a student, you would get buzzed in, same with people, and you had to check in with somebody. So depending upon the schools, and I don't know all of the details, some have systems in place to at least keep people from just walking right in. Then the question becomes, do you put armed individuals in the schools, be it teachers, and I know you're not in favor of that proposal. Do you put school resource officers there, retired officers? Do you have a dedicated police officer there? Uh, there's no, there's no, I don't think there's a clear cut answer as to the best way to do it. We're all gonna disagree on that. Churches are certainly free to take up their own uh, security measures, and they do. In fact, Mr. Prince spoke at a uh, seminar which he can tell you about where a number of churches in the area came together to talk about security plans for their places of worship. So there are things that can be done that don't necessarily require laws to do it. It requires a community response to look at and evaluate what's going on within the community and how can they fix it. What can they me, do as far as their own private facilities or the public schools for instance, it doesn't necessarily require a law and quite frankly a law is only as good as the people that follow it. Then I guess we shouldn't have any laws. There shouldn't be laws against murder. There shouldn't be laws against anything. No laws against theft, because some people simply won't uh, follow it. I, I want to point out an area of agreement that you and I have, and that is education. Education about handling of guns. I utterly agree with you. Thank you. And I also agree with you that this might be what we're up to, which is hardening our schools, making our schools more like prisons if we legislatures and if uh, the federal government fails to act to protect our families. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to respond one thing, and I am not going to put this out publicly because I do have grave concerns about other potential attacks on our children. But it goes well beyond our schools. It is not just a matter of hardening our schools. There are other related activities that need to be protected, and that is a debate that should happen, but behind closed doors so that individuals who are likely to carry out those types of atrocious attacks are not informed of those possibilities or ways in which to carry out their terrorism. Representative Stevens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks again for your testimony. I, I know you mentioned some other areas of concern. I don't think, um, and maybe I missed it, I was going through, I didn't necessarily see my bill um, addressed in your materials. I, I could have missed it again. I was paging through pretty quickly. But if, if you had, you know, some thoughts on ways that we might be able to, um, or, or concerns that you had uh, with the bill, I'd certainly be interested to hear them because, um, you know, I'd like to uh, try to address them if we can. Sure. I believe the extreme Risk Protection Order uh, Review is on page 8 of uh, Exhibit H. All right, I think, if I remember correctly, those were two other bills. My bill is House Bill 2227, and those were Senate Bill 18 and House Bill 2109. Um, mine, uh, I think mine's pretty unique in its approach. Uh, we tried to 
incorporate things from several other states that have adopted them. Um, and also, as I mentioned, had some preliminary conversations with some folks on, on both sides of this issue and tried to incorporate many of their thoughts. So I'm, I'm interested to hear uh, what else we can do. I believe there's a number of concerns when we look to the constitutional issues, both under the U.S. and Pennsylvania Constitution when it comes to due process. And in fact, that's part of the reason why when we look to federal law, it specifies that a prohibition only results after the individual is provided notice of a hearing, provided in hearing, and an opportunity to be heard. Because we acknowledge that due process mandates that notice and opportunity to be heard before stripping someone, especially of a constitutional right. Also, there's a grave concern over uh, the process for those ex parte hearings. I understand that you're uh, bill would suggest that public defenders be made available for those who are low income. What about those who are not low income? And quite honestly, in my experience, especially where public defenders are provided under Section 303 of the Mental Health and Procedures Act, I have yet to see a public defender actually defend that individual who is being subject to those proceedings. Generally, it is a stipulation that, yep, this individual can be involuntarily committed for up to 20 more days. So while I, I don't want to discredit the Public Defender's Office, uh, and it's not a statement on public defenders across the Commonwealth, there is a concern over the amount of uh, cases they have to uh, handle and their ability to adeptly handle those cases, especially when you're going to be placing these additional obligations on them. As an attorney, I can tell you that to represent an individual in this type of situation, you're potentially looking at thousands of dollars. You mentioned the possibility of going out and getting a psychological evaluation. Generally, that's going to cost $2,000 for an MMPI testing to be performed by a psychologist. It's generally going to take one to two days. That means that individual will be out of work for one to two days while that testing is performed, all so that that individual can go into a proceeding where there's already been an ex parte order issued against him or her. That is a grave concern when we start to look at the constitutional rights, which again, under the Pennsylvania Constitution, are acknowledged to be inviolate. Heaven, has the court, and this is your area of expertise, um, has the court opined on the constitutionality of the current uh, ex parte proceeding with regard to PFAs and, frankly, 302s? They have not, with regard to my knowledge, with regards to uh, ex parte PFAs. They have just recently, the Western District of Pennsylvania, in a case I litigated, Frank, Alton Franklin versus Sessions et al., held that because of the lack of due process provided under Section 302 of the Mental Health and Procedures Act, it is not sufficient to trigger a federal prohibition because of the absence of that due process. And that, but that's only in the Western District. In the Middle District and the Eastern District, the the standard of the 302 being a lifetime prohibitor still is in place, even absent those, um, those due process protections. It's my understanding that that's the position of the U.S. government. It's hard to fathom how that is a correct interpretation based on the court's determination that it doesn't meet the requisite due process uh, analyses. Yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with you. I'm not quarreling with, with that contention that the 302 procedure is devoid of due process that probably should be incorporated when you're talking about a lifetime deprivation of a constitutional right. I, I can understand that. Um, and frankly, we had that in mind when we were drafting um, my bill. So I guess if the ex parte provisions regarding the PFA Act have been upheld as constitutional. They haven't been held as constitutional, they haven't been challenged. Again, you're talking about tens of thousands of dollars that an individual or entity would have to put forth to, to actually challenge these types of provisions. So they haven't, I mean, look, if they haven't been, they haven't been struck down, and they've been in place for many, many years, certainly, you know, thousands and thousands of individuals have been subject to them. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to understand um, upon what legal authority, you know, you make that uh, statement that um, the, no, I get it. I, and I understand you're entitled to your opinion about what the Constitution says, but has someone who's been elected a judge in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, do they happen to agree with your opinion um, as it relates to that ex parte proceeding? There's and never it, been a challenge because it's a limited period of time. There's only 10 days for an actual hearing to be held on the 
at underlying PFA. So there is no real opportunity for someone to mount a full-blown challenge because by the point in time the challenge would be determined, it would in essence be moot. Well, I mean, you could presumably you could seek to get an injunction to prevent the imposition of that disability um, immediately, right? I mean, you have that you have the ability to seek that relief. Um, it, do you envision any scenario where an ex parte proceeding could, for the slightest period of time, limit the right to keep and bear arms? The U.S. Supreme Court has acknowledged that in the absence of a hearing being provided pre-deprivation, there are occasions where a post-deprivation hearing is sufficient. However, it must be held in a very close proximity to the ex parte order, and you must obviously provide the other individual, the person who's being aggrieved by it, the opportunity to be heard and to provide a defense. So. I acknowledge the U.S. Supreme Court has even stated that there are occasions, but they have limited those occasions, whereby someone can be temporarily uh, denied a even constitutional right, provided that there are mechanisms in place for a timely hearing. Okay. So um, if you don't mind, I mean, if you want to get me that site maybe, um, that would be terrific, and we can try to make sure that we are staying within the, the confines of that. Um, you know, jurisprudence as it relates to the constitutionality, and, and then that may be one way to address um, those constitutional concerns that you raised. It seems like that might be the, the right direction to, uh, to start looking at what parameters the court has already laid out, right? The concern is obviously vindictive use of these processes, and I handled a case out in Cambria County where an individual had over 300 firearms taken in relation to an ex parte PFA. The, when the hearing was held, uh, on the final PFA, the judge was so incensed by the lack of any basis for not only a final PFA, but even for the issuance of the ex parte PFA that he vacated both and ordered the firearms to be returned. However, then the court directed that the respondent, who was found not to have done anything wrong, had to pay the fees of the sheriff's department for going out and taking his 306 guns, and there were thousands of dollars being assessed against him for having done nothing wrong. Thankfully, we had a judge where, when we addressed the constitutional issues before him, said, no, this is wrong, and directed the sheriff to return all the firearms at no cost to the respondent. Well, one of the provisions in my bill does require, or, or does provide for, um, penalties for those who would provide false information. And I know, I, certainly I appreciate your support for mandatory minimum sentences. That's been my bill for the last several sessions. Um, um, I've also uh, did the bill to um, increase the penalties for those who are illegally possessing firearms, um, uh, things along those lines. So I share your, your feelings in that regard, and I think that would be applicable here. If we provide for some strong penalties for those that would abuse this, uh, this approach, um, I think we can deter that type of conduct and ensure that people are not being wrongfully ensnared with, um, you know, with these provisions. So um, again, I'm, I'm happy to work with you to make sure that there are robust penalties for those that might abuse this uh, approach um, for some ul ulterior motive. Um, happy to work with you in that regard. I look forward to it. Thank you. So within this time segment, we have time for one more question. Representative Saccone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, the question was posed, what can we do to save lives? And that one of the uh, comments was that our children are being slaughtered as babies. And we tend to point to the instrument uh, as the problem here, in this case, guns. But if you want to use that logic, I say we can ban those abortion scalpels and we'll save 30,000 lives a year. Um, so what we can do, though, do you agree, is uh, have threat assessments for uh, all of our schools uh, because every school is different. There's no cookie cutter, uh, there's no cookie cutter solution to our schools uh, being hardened one way or another. Some schools have certain uh, techniques they've already applied. Some might not need them. Uh, we, we need to look at each school independently and see what the threat is and what uh, techniques we need to, to uh, make that school safer. Absolutely. I completely agree that we need those threat assessments. I believe there are organizations, I believe one is in attendance today, Rockwell Tactical, that has experience doing it not just for schools but also for 
churches and other uh, court facilities. Uh, they've done some phenomenal work with, uh, I believe, the Chester County Courthouse. Um, so there are those organizations that stand ready here in the Commonwealth already to provide those threat assessments for schools. And I know there was a comment made about the recent shooting and the fact that the school was hardened there. I'm not so sure how hardened it was uh, when we had an individual able to walk in with those firearms without being checked. Why aren't we going to clear backpacks? Why aren't we having metal detectors in the schools? Why aren't we taking those precautions to prevent these types of attacks as well as having armed uh, either teachers or resource officers that are available to respond to situations? As I said in my testimony, Israel has been doing it since its inception and has been doing it very well we could take some great advice from Israel and how they have ensured that there aren't these types of atrocious attacks in Israel, and we know that in Israel they're under constant attack. The uh, NRA also does have a program that's provided free to schools who want to utilize it for exactly that kind of assessment as well. So uh, that is another option. Obviously, it, it's up to the school to seek it out, but options do exist. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time and your testimony. I'd like to recognize Representative Schemmel, who's joined us. So next to testify is Mary Beth Stanton Christensen, Moms Demand Action, and also Sarah Higginbotham, Every Town for Gun Safety. Welcome. You may begin when you're ready. Good morning. I am Mary Beth Christensen. I am a volunteer for Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense <clears throat> in America. Moms is an all volunteer organization. We are nonpartisan, we are single issue, we are grassroots, we are dedicated to ending the epidemic of gun violence in America. With close to 5 million members across the country and 14 active chapters in Pennsylvania, we are the largest gun violence prevention organization in the United States. And I am the volunteer state legislative lead for Moms Demand. I am also a responsible gun owner. I want to thank Ron Marsico for these seven hearing days on firearms and public safety. I've seen throughout the seven hearing days, um, and it's been confirmed again today, that any discussion of the right to bear arms and the right to be safe is a hot button one. Common ground and joint solutions often get lost in heated rhetoric and emotion. So Chairman Marsico, I sincerely thank you for scheduling these hearings and inviting all points of view to be heard. And I know that we can find common ground. I've lived on both sides of this debate. I was born in Southwest Philadelphia into a family with virtually no exposure to guns. My only experience with guns was uh, an armed home invasion of my godmother, and two armed robberies of my uncle's corner grocery in South Philadelphia. I moved to college in Washington, D.C. Um, I was educated at Catholic U on the Brookland campus. Uh, it was a site of frequent shootings, and for four years I lived in a room, first floor, with bars on my windows. We had a sexual assault on my floor my junior year, and D.C. cops in my lobby uh, for the four semesters after that. But then I left DC and moved to Carlisle for law school, and I married into a very large, very extended family of central Pennsylvania hunters. I came to understand and respect and eventually enjoy the sportsman's tradition, and my husband and I raised our three adult children as responsible gun owners. So I've lived this issue, and one thing I know for certain is that Second Amendment advocates and gun safety advocates have more in common than we care to admit, and certainly more in common than we get credit for. And that brings me to the work of Pennsylvania Moms and the domestic violence protection bills which are pending before this committee. Your former colleague, Tom Killian, introduced SB 501 a year and a half ago in the Senate. And two months ago yesterday, that bill was unanimously passed by the Senate. It's before the committee now. 
Shortly thereafter, your colleague, Marguerite Quinn, introduced HB 2060, which pretty much mirrors um, SB 501. It needs some of the, the later amendments that we negotiated with the gun lobby. But that too is before your committee. And I'm gonna just refer to the bill as 501. It's a bill that quickly disarms convicted domestic abusers and safely secures their weapons. What it requires is that within 24 hours of a criminal conviction for misdemeanor domestic violence, or within 48 hours of being placed under a final protection from abuse order, the abuser turns over his firearms to law enforcement to a federally licensed gun dealer, or in the case of a final PFA, to a designated attorney. Importantly, SB 501 does not apply to those who are simply accused of domestic violence. It applies only after abusers have had their full day in court, have exercised their constitutional rights to due process, and the court has found the uh, abuser to be guilty of the crime of domestic violence or to be so dangerous that he must be placed under a final protection from abuse order. So I agree with Representative Saccone. It's, it's not the gun, it's the person. And here, this is a person who has been adjudicated a domestic abuser and is prohibited from holding a gun. So Pennsylvania Moms for the last year has worked closely with the Pennsylvania Commission Against Domestic Violence to pass this critically needed bill. It's endorsed by the state police chiefs, the state sheriffs, and the state district attorneys associations. It's not an exaggeration for me to say to this committee, time is of the essence to pass SB 501. Why the urgency? Because domestic violence in America is to a significant degree a problem of gun violence. Every year in this country, there are over five million incidents of intimate partner violence. And we know that when a gun is present in these incidents, the victim is five times more likely to be killed. In an average month in our country, 50 women are shot to death by their intimate partner. And another one million American women alive today have been shot at by an intimate partner. We know that domestic abusers use guns to control their victim even if they never pull the trigger. Over four million American women today have been threatened with a gun by an intimate partner. And we know all too well that domestic violence drives the majority of mass shootings in this country. Nearly 60% of mass shootings in America over five years involve the shooter killing a former spouse, an intimate partner, or a family member. And Pennsylvania reflects these national statistics. In the last 10 years, 1,600 Pennsylvanians died from domestic violence. In 2016 alone, just over 100 Pennsylvanians were murdered in domestic violence incidents. The majority of them were shot Two of the victims were our law enforcers. So yes, time is of the essence because guns and domestic violence are a deadly combination. I wanna depart from my remarks to um, reference the appendix that uh, the prior speakers submitted. Um, on page 25 of Mr. Prince and Mr. Kraut's submission to the committee, uh, paragraph, Two, uh, the attorney state, House Bill 2060 and Senate Bill 501 are substantially similar and seek to require individuals who become prohibited due to a domestic violence conviction or protection from abuse order to turn in their firearms and ammunition. This is the important part. Even though 18 U.S.C. section 922 sub G8 and sub G9 already preclude those subject to a protection from abuse order or domestic violence conviction from possessing firearms or ammunitions. That is accurate. It's completely incomplete. As uh, these two Pennsylvania attorneys well know, Pennsylvania has never complied with federal law. 
for over 20 years since the Lautenberg Amendments were added to the Brady Law. Abusers under a final protection from abuse order or who have been convicted of a misdemeanor domestic violence crime are prohibited from holding guns. But that hasn't been the case in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, if you're currently convicted or placed under a final protection from abuse order, you need not surrender your judge, your, your guns. That requires a separate order by the judge. And that happens in only one of seven cases. If you are convicted of the crime of misdemeanor domestic violence, Pennsylvania does require you to hand over your guns. But we currently give the abuser a 60-day grace period before he needs to turn over his guns. And incredibly, in Pennsylvania, when these abusers finally do turn over their guns, it's the abuser's decision who gets to hold that gun or guns for safekeeping. Not the judge, not the prosecutor, and certainly not the victim. It's the abuser's choice. Now, turning back to um, page 25 of Mr. Kraut, Mr. Prince's testimony, um, they state that we have been, quote, unable to show a single occasion where an individual gained access to firearms from third party safekeepers. So I will um, give you two examples. They asked for one, I'll give you two. In early 2011, Tina Souders, a 39 year old mom of two boys and a nurse right down the road here in Chambersburg, asked for a final protection from abuse order from the court Fulton County Court of Common Pleas. The court placed the boyfriend under the final protection from abuse order. It granted Tina's request and told the boyfriend to turn in his firearms. He did, as was the boyfriend's right in 2011 and as is a boyfriend or abusive partner's right today. He decided who would get the firearms and he gave them to his sister who promptly returned them for the murder of Tina Souders. That's example number one. Example number two, I'm wearing right here on this button. Michael Ayers, two years old, shot in the back by his father. Sorry. We know the family, so we get a little emotional. <sighs> Michael was a toddler from Huntington County. In 2013, his mom, Holly, went to the Huntington County Court of Common Pleas and asked that the abusive dad be placed under a final protection from abuse order. She also asked that his extensive um, collection of weapons be turned in and that request was denied. When it was denied, his parents, the, the abuser's parents stepped in and took the weapons for safekeeping because they were afraid of what might happen. Within a month, the abusive dad had reclaimed the weapons and during a custody exchange, shot his two-year-old son in the back shot the mom once in the face and twice, or three times rather, in her legs. Mom survived, Michael did not. That's example number two. So I would say to Mr. Prince and Mr. Kraut and to all of us, shame on us. We don't know whether Michael and Tina would be alive today had Pennsylvania law been in compliance with long-standing federal law. But what we do know is that the list of victims will continue to grow unless we follow federal law and pass SB 501 and quickly disarm convicted domestic abusers. And when I say the list of victims, I include law enforcement on that list. I'm sure you know, Representative Joswiak, that responses to domestic violence calls are the most dangerous response for 
first responders. More officers are killed responding to domestic violence calls than any other call for service. And in 2016, two Pennsylvania law enforcers paid the ultimate price. Cannonsburg police officer Scott Bashum, a 52-year-old Air Force veteran, a dad of four, and a devoted husband, was murdered responding to a domestic abuse call on November 10th. The following month, on December 30th, 2016, Pennsylvania State Trooper Landon Weaver of the Bedford Station was also murdered by gun, responding to a domestic violence call. He was just 23 years old and recently married. So Pennsylvania Moms urges this committee and the full house to honor these victims to act on the endorsement of the state police chiefs, sheriffs, and district attorneys association, and to follow the anonymous action of our Senate. Chairman Marsico, this is the common ground that you referenced in your introduction. Thank you. Um, and now I'll introduce my colleague from every town, Sarah Higginbotham, who would like to address ERPO. Thank you, Chair Marsico and committee members for the opportunity to testify today. Obviously, we've submitted um, substantial written testimony, so I'm gonna try and highlight here the high points. I know you have a long list this morning, um, and we deeply appreciate all of your time in hearing the critical issue, hearing testimony on the critical issue of gun violence prevention. My name is Sarah Higginbotham, and I am a Regional Director of State Affairs with Everytown for Gun Safety, and here also on behalf of the Pennsylvania Chapter of Moms Demand Action, which is part of Everytown. We are the largest gun violence prevention organization in the country, and uh, the Pennsylvania chapter of Moms Man Action represents uh, tens of thousands of Pennsylvanians around the state, including 14 local chapters. You already heard from Shira from Ceasefire PA about some of the suicide statistics here, so I'm not going to I um, am not going to repeat all of them. Um, but I will just highlight a few. In an average year, nearly 1,500 Pennsylvanians are shot and killed with a firearm, and between 2012 and 2016, suicide by gun accounted for 62% of all firearm fatalities in this state. Um, you've already heard about our avid support over the last three and a half years on domestic violence legislation. Um, and we certainly urge your passage to support that. But I'm also, we are also here today to highlight as well the red flag legislation, also known as ERPO, introduced by Representative Stevens, House Bill 2227, which is another critically important policy. Um, right now, when family or law enforcement see warning signs that someone is likely to pose a risk of harming themselves or others, there are certain ways that they can take action. But when it comes to restricting, uh, restricting a person's access to firearms, they are too often powerless to act. You heard a few examples that Shira also mentioned earlier, and in um, my written testimony, you'll find um, both research on the number of mass shootings that we studied where uh, there were warning signs flagged, and then you've also heard about some of the higher profile instances, the Parkland shooter, the Isla Vista shooting. Like federal law, Pennsylvania currently does prohibit gun possession by certain people, including those who have been convicted of serious crimes, adjudicated mentally ill, or committed to a psychiatric hospital, or who are subject to a domestic violence restraining order. However, if a person shows warning signs that they are likely to use guns to harm themselves or others, and they do not fall into one of those prohibited categories, they will still be able to purchase and possess guns. Red flag laws like House Bill 2227 can save lives by empowering family members, and that's really key, and law enforcement to act when they see these warning signs. I'm just skipping ahead because I know you've heard a fair amount of this already. In short, by creating a new type of court order usually referred to, as you've heard, as an extreme risk protection order, red flag laws establish a fair process by which courts can temporarily restrict a person's access to firearms, as Rep Representative Stevens has explained. That process is modeled after the process for obtaining domestic violence restraining orders, which are currently available in all 50 states, and allow the courts to determine whether a person is likely to harm themselves or others. with a firearm, and if they are to prohibit them from purchasing and possessing firearms and order them to surrender any firearms in their possession while the order remains in effect. 
There are two sections um, also in my testimony, one again on mass shootings and the other on gun suicide, and I want to come back to that again. Um, in the aftermath of the Parkland shooting, which received so much national attention, these laws, and I work in more states than just Pennsylvania, though Pennsylvania is my favorite, um, and I appreciate again the opportunity to be here. Um, we have seen these bills get on these red flag law laws and legislation get unprecedented support by both parties and in large measure by Republicans around the country. I want to come back while the conversation has been largely on mass shootings to the problem of suicide. Um, the country as a whole and here in Pennsylvania is in the midst of a firearm suicide epidemic. Um, and I just will underscore quickly one thing that um, Shira Goodman mentioned earlier today because it is so important. Guns are used in over half of all suicide deaths and that's important to note. Those numbers are high for a simple reason. Because guns are more lethal than almost any other method of self-harm and people who attempt suicide with a gun are overwhelmingly likely to die. Simply put, reducing a suicidal person's access to guns can save their life. Nine out of 10 suicide attempts with a gun result in death. By contrast, most people who attempt suicide by other means survive and they do not eventually die by suicide. This Connecticut study, which again, Shira mentioned, but I'd like um, and happy to provide to the committee. We didn't actually submit a copy, but we will do so. Um, just highlight the number. The ERPO law, the red flag law that's been there for a number of years and was the first state to pass it, the Duke study estimated that the law had already averted 72 suicides. And in addition, and this gets to something that was brought up earlier about what are we doing to get these people help when it comes to mental health or resources they may need. In addition, the study found that nearly half, um, half of the gun removal cases in Connecticut led to people receiving mental health treatment they might not have otherwise received. So that's a really critical part, and this can be a gateway to connecting people with the resources that they might need to get help. In short, red flag laws can provide a lifeline for people in crisis and for their families, helping to avert suicides and get help to those who need it. Um, quickly, you have the bill sponsor here, and again, we thank Representative Stevens for his dedication and his work on this. And I just want to highlight um, very quickly and then wrap up um, a few of the policy elements. We take um, respect for the Second Amendment very, very seriously at every town and at Moms and look at every piece of legislation before we support it to make sure um, that it does respect the Second Amendment and that the rights of law-abiding gun owners are being um, given due attention, rightfully so. So we believe that Representative Stevens' bill ensures appropriate due process and appropriate standards. Let me just highlight a few points. Final orders can only be issued after a full hearing is held at which all parties have an opportunity to be heard. Temporary ex parte orders can be issued before a hearing, but only if the danger is imminent. These orders only last for a short period of time, as you've heard, no more than 10 days, at which point a hearing must be held before a final issue, final order is issued. Here's what House Bill 2227 will do. It will establish clear standards for who may petition the court to issue an order, what evidence must be presented in support of such petitions, and what factors the court must consider when deciding a petition. Number two, it will establish appropriate burdens of proof. That's important for the petitioner that the petitioner must meet to justify the issuance of either a temporary or a final order. Number three, in addition to ensuring all parties an opportunity to be heard before final orders are issued, House Bill 2227 also affords those who are made subject to final orders an opportunity to request that the court terminate the order once it's issued, if they can demonstrate that they no longer pose a threat. And finally, if an order expires and is not renewed, the firearms prohibitions are lifted and they can retrieve their firearms, as has been discussed here today, as long as they're not otherwise legally prohibited from having them, which happens when the background check takes uh, place. Uh, just a note around uh, the bipartisan support and the wave of legislation around red flag laws that we've seen. Um, Republicans and Democrats in at least 29 states right now, your colleagues in state legislatures around the country are considering these bills. Eight states now have red flag laws. In the years since Connecticut and Indiana passed precursor laws, red flag laws have been enacted in California, Washington, on the ballot, and Oregon. And most recently, since the Parkland shooting, Florida, Maryland, 
and Vermont have all been recently signed by governors and extra points to anyone who can name, though I'm not, I'll just tell you, but who can name what those three states all have in common. They all have Republican governors and long-standing traditions of responsible gun ownership. Um, so I will leave you with that thought. And again, on behalf of the Pennsylvania chapter of Moms Demand Action, I thank you and all, thank you Chair Marsco and the members of this committee for joining in this conversation. And we urge your swift support of uh, the domestic violence legislation and uh, Representative Stevens' bill, House Bill 2227. Thank you. Representative, Representative Cicone, you waved off? Okay, uh, any questions or comments by members? Yeah, none. Thank you for your time and your testimony. Thank you. Our next testifier is our Lindsay Nichols, Federal Policy Director of Giffords Law Center, and David Chipman, Senior Advisor of the Giffords Law Center. Good morning and welcome. You may begin when you're ready. Thank you, Chairman Marsico, members of the committee, for the opportunity to testify here today. My name is Lindsay Nichols. I am the Federal Policy Director for the Giffords Law Center, an organization founded by attorneys after a mass shooting at a law firm in California in 1993. We recently merged with the gun safety organization founded by former Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords and her husband, Mark Kelly. I have been personally with the Law Center for almost 12 years. Most of that time I've spent comparing and contrasting different state laws. I want to start here today by uh, thanking Representative Stevens for your work on HB 2227. This bill, the Extreme Risk Protection Order Bill, um, is a relatively new um, policy, but it's one which is spreading like really like wildfire across the country and garnering the support of a very diverse group of, of different constituents. Um, I'm here to urge your support for this measure because this measure fixes a very specific problem that exists in many state, law, state laws. There's a gap here that can be filled and by filling it, you will save lives. The many mass shootings our nation has experienced in recent years, from Newtown to Las Vegas to Orlando to Parkland and most recently to Santa Fe, these shootings often, but not always, but often do have a common thread. Family members often saw signs and grew concerned beforehand. Sometimes they reached out to law enforcement. The, per the person had threatened to commit violence or had threatened to commit suicide. But family members and other community members, including law enforcement officers, had no legal mechanism to respond. There was no way to prevent the person's access to guns, even temporarily. But these tragedies are preventable. These, this new policy, these extreme risk protection orders, provide this legal mechanism. To do, to do so, to remove guns temporarily from a person who is shown to be at a high risk of violence. As you've already heard, eight other states have now enacted these laws, and the, most three, the three most recent were signed by Republican governors. Medical groups, mental health practitioners, academics, including professors of law and psychiatry and gun policy, law enforcement um, officers, gun violence survivors and survivors of suicide attempts have all supported this proposal. In March, we heard the National Rifle Association post a video expressing support for extreme risk protection orders. What's clear is that the existing system isn't working. Simply, in the, the process for involuntarily committing a person to a mental institution is often insufficient because these people may not have a diagnosable mental illness. I heard a call for more data earlier, for more evidence, and this is a policy based on evidence. The evidence shows, the research shows that the most, the best predictor that someone's gonna commit violence is an actual threat that they're gonna commit violence. Or violence in another form beforehand. 
the best predictor that someone's going to die by suicide is that they've threatened to kill themselves. Um, this, this policy is designed to pre present, get that evidence before a court and, pre and prevent those tragedies before they occur. It's based on the domestic violence system. The protection from abuse order often includes a temporary deprivation of rights like your right to see your children, your right to go on your own, own property, on the home where you live. But courts have balanced those rights with the need for immediate action when there's a serious danger to a person's life and safety. Um, I've heard uh, the opposition capitalize on this misunderstanding of what due process really means. Notice in a hearing is a great sound bite, but the courts are much, take a much more nuanced approach to these kinds of issues. There's a balancing act, the person's rights get balanced with the, the interests of public safety and the, uh, the value that additional procedures will add. This bill is loaded, as you've already heard over and over again, with these kinds of procedures that the courts have upheld. Um, there is a particular case that, in which there was a, a Section 1983 challenge to the domestic violence restraining order system, the ex parte provision of it. Um, it was in the Western District of Wisconsin in the 1980s, and the court um, upheld that system by doing this balancing act, by balancing the procedures that were available with the need for immediate action in order to prevent a serious danger to life and safety. Um, in this bill, we have the, a very similar process based on Pennsylvania's own system. Um, there's standards, burdens of proof. The order can last no longer than a year without renewal. And on renewal, again, the petitioner, the person who wants the order, bears the burden of proof of pre preventing, um, presenting the evidence to the, to the court. Um, as you've already heard, these laws are shown, have been shown effective at reducing suicides, of which Pennsylvania has many. In 2016 alone, 976 people died by gun suicide in Pennsylvania, and that's just one year. That's a lot of people. Um, you've heard about the evidence from uh, Duke University about the effectiveness of the Connecticut law. Um, sometimes a brief separ separation between the guns and the person is all it takes to avoid a tragedy. And that's what this bill would do. Um, I urge you to support this bill and I thank you for your time. Good morning. Um, and thank you, um, committee chair and all the representatives. And I'm quite impressed we're running on time for such a complicated uh, subject. Um, my name is David Chipman. Um, I served this nation for 25 years as a special agent with ATF. Um, my whole professional life has been focused on this very, very complex issue um, regarding violence and particularly violence committed with guns. Uh, today, I serve as a policy advisor to Gabby Giffords and Mark Kelly. And it's a fair question to ask, like, well, how would a retired ATF guy in retirement end up working for them? Uh, there are two reasons. Um, I was attracted to the courage of Gabby Giffords, um, you know, surviving an assassination attempt and being committed to this issue, the same issue I'm concerned about. And I felt it was a safe place for me to talk my truth uh, working for a guy like Mark Kelly, who I know had served his nation in combat, uh, had showed great courage in Nassau, and was the parent of two cops, uh, excuse me, the son of two police officers. So I understood, the, you know, felt that he understood what it was like to be part of a police family and be concerned not as much about politics, but why we get into policing. Um, I became an ATF agent um, because it seemed like too many people were dying by guns and bombs, and I wanted to prevent that from happening. Uh, after 25 years, I think it's fair to say that I felt that maybe ATF really should have stood for after the fact, in that the way that our laws are structured, um, elected public officials have put laws in place that really punish the guilty severely and sometimes that deters crime. Um, I often felt that we, we did have adequate resources much of the time to try to do a good and professional job, 
But what was missing was that type of law when you could see the bad thing coming and you didn't have the authority to stop it. And that was the frustrating thing. Um, when they're really on the ground, there wasn't much debate. You know, family members were asking for help. Your peers in law enforcement knew something was going to happen. It was like a train coming down the road. But you just didn't have the power to do anything. And that's why I'm here to talk about uh, extreme risk protection orders. Um, I'm not going to, you have my written testimony, you've heard a lot about this, but I wanted to talk to you specifically from a law enforcement perspective why I think this is unique and why I'm personally excited about it and my peers are. And that is first, it's an extreme risk protection order. It's not a some kind of risk or maybe something bad is going to happen. This is an instance where there's agreement. Um, a lot of the due process talk I found interesting today because it's focused on the potential um, person who might be impacted by the action. But as a law enforcement officer, I love due process. What that means to me is I'm not having to exercise my own personal discretion, but I've actually had what the decision or the action I'm going to have to take already vetted by the courts. I'm being told by a judge what I'm about to do is okay, and it's what the community wants me to do. That's a, a higher level of confidence than when I have to make a split-second decision on the street. Should I do A or B? So to me, due process is a very valuable thing, and it's the kind of thing we want to talk about when we're talking about community policing. We want laws where community members, families, police and courts work together and come to the best decision they can at a time. What ERPO does for me is, is it might not present, uh, prevent something from bad happening forever, but it buys us time. It buys us time to figure out, like there have been rightful questions, like once you take the guns away, well, what's going to happen to this person? Are they going to get well? I don't know, but it buys us time to do the right thing. And so to me, I, I'm a kind of common sense guy. Like, we can't solve everything today, but this just seems like it just makes total sense and that we could get this done. And that's why I think I'm excited to see we've got Republicans and Democrats doing this. And the beautiful thing is, is like Pennsylvania doesn't have to be first. Like, it's already been done. Um, cops are already less learning lessons learned and communities are learning lessons learned. And so we have the evidence. Will this prevent every act of violence with a gun? Of course not. But guess what? It's already prevented some people from getting hurt with a gun. It's already happened. So, you know, if taking a vote, like, seems one life or two lives, and we figure out how not to inappropriately use this law, like, to me, that's like low-hanging fruit. Uh, so that's why I came uh, here to, you know, offer just my personal opinion, my experience. I'm happy to ask any questions. But I took the chairman's um, uh, suggestion to also listen. So I've listened today, and I want to make one comment about another bill that's been brought here uh, as well. Domestic violence issues are, are just the most complex for law enforcement, the most risky. I mean, that's the real deal. And, and if there is legislation here that can really, what I heard, just simply encourage the state of Pennsylvania to do more aggressively what we were doing at ATF under federal law, that to me seems again like a, 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 a like a win-win, something we should agree on. And so, um, that's I'll stop my remarks there, and happy to ask any questions you might have. Are there any questions, from members? Who's down there? Representative Dean. Thank you both for your work and your testimony, and send our best to the Congresswoman and the the Captain for their terrific work. Um, one thing I was thinking about, maybe the Law Center would be a resource to us on this. On the issue of suicide, uh, what can you tell us about legislation, means matters legislation? I, I have a dear friend whose who's adult son uh, bought a gun first time in his life, uh, just a couple weeks before he used that gun to kill himself. Uh, it, it, it was clear that he wasn't interested in it for hunting, self-protection, those kinds of things. So what can you tell us, what can we learn, what can gun shop owners learn uh, about means matters legislation and, and can we get at some of the folks that are buying that the red flags are going up there? 
Yeah, that's an interesting question, and there are several different um, levels to this. I mean, I think this particular proposal that's on the table here is designed at a, exactly that problem um, in that it um, can be used to prevent a person from having access to guns during a very temporary period. Um, we ha There has been a lot of evidence sh that shows that um, if a person has access to guns and they attempt suicide, they're much more likely to die. 85%, um, maybe 90% of people who attempt suicide with a gun die. If you look at something like poisoning, the percentage is much lower. I believe it's a less than 20% of the people who attempt suicide by poisoning themselves actually die. What that means then is, I mean, sometimes we hear the opposition say, well, they'll just try again. That's actually not true. 90% of the people who live through a suicide attempt don't end up dying by suicide. So just because you've tried suicide once, if you haven't actually died, chances are you're gonna live. Um, but if you tried with a gun, well, you're already dead and there's no second chances. Um, so me, as you said, means do matter and there's a whole body of research on that fact. In fact, um, in, and this goes, this applies in various situations. In England, for example, they changed the rules about gas ovens. You've heard the phrase, put your head in the oven. Um, when they changed the rules about gas ovens, the number of suicides dropped because means the access to what is used to commit the suicide, um, it, they really do matter. So this bill would provide that kind of temporary removal of the means during the period when, um, when uh, suicide is a real issue. Um, we have heard, in, there have been a series of interviews of people who've attempted suicide and lived, and many of them say, well, I only decided to try this a few minutes beforehand. Um, in fact, I think the, the statistic, I believe, was the majority of them decided within 15 minutes of making the actual attempt that they were going to do the actual attempt. So that, it's the time period that, is, um, that, uh, that can make a difference as well as the, the actual device. And at the point of purchase, I'm thinking for gun store owners, um, uh, what kind of education can we do there? Yeah, there, there, um, there are uh, certainly warning signs that um, gun store owners need to be educated that this is an issue. They need to know that when a person comes in and something's just not quite right, um, they have the ability. They are under no obligation to go ahead with that sale. Um, some of them feel like, well, it's not my job to, to make those decisions. Um, we'll just assume the background check knows everything. Well, the background check doesn't know everything. So it is very important, I think, to educate gun store owners that they do have the ability to make the decision just to not make the sale in that case. Any other questions? So you none. Well, thank you very much again for your time and testimony. Appreciate it. So next to testify is Kim Stauffer, President of the Firearms Owners Against Crime. Welcome, Kim. Go ahead when you're ready. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> excuse, me, excuse me. And uh, members of this committee, I want to thank you very much for allowing me to testify today. I appreciate the invitation, and I take this responsibility to testify solemnly because I believe, as you know, over the last 35 years of my involvement in this issue, I've tried to always present the facts. And for the record, my name is Kim Stolfer. I'm president of Firearms Owners Against Crime. I've, um, I am also NRA certified firearms training counselor, former Marine, and uh, I've trained thousands of people to shoot, and I believe strongly in truth. And I think that's one of the things that we suffer from today. And I say that because in my course of being involved in this, and I'm going to depart from my testimony because it's quite lengthy, and I'd like to address some additional issues that have come up. I see a lot of rhetoric in the media and in public statements being made. And I see this in light of the fact that we have an extreme, we have a, um, uh, an epidemic of violence. 
when the alternative is, the alternate is true. You look at the facts. Uh, when this panel opened today, um, the uh, gentleman from the Harrisburg University said that uh, uh, we need to look at this from a factual and a scientific standpoint. So why aren't we? Why are we talking about things that really don't exist? Why are we talking in ways that not contribute to solutions? All my life I've worked in the private sector and then in government with the Postal Service. And, but my job was always to find solutions to problems. I represent Firearms Owners Against Crime, an all-volunteer group, because we believe strongly in fixing the problems, not playing games with them. So let me give you an example. In 1995, a state publication called Laws Relating to Guns had 50 pages in its publication. Today, that same publication is 148 pages. So do we ever ask the question of where did the laws fail? Why do we have laws now that aren't being applied? We have laws against possessing firearms, youth possessing firearms in schools. We talk about gun-free zones. But do we realize that every school in this country is a gun-free zone, according to federal law and most of the state laws? That's a complete gun ban. We're not talking about gun owners' rights in there. <clears throat> and I'm not here to defend guns. I'm here to defend freedom. I fought for that for this country. So I'm before you today to talk about things in a little bit of a different fashion. Because the National Academy of Sciences in 2004 studied every gun control measure. At that time, it was over 100 of them. And they could not ascertain that one even worked did anything. So we pass these laws, not cognizant of the unintended consequences, nor looking at the crime rate as to whether or not it actually functioned. And do we really want solutions? I think all of us do, but the method we get there sometimes is obscured by politics. And to that, that does nothing for the victims of these laws. It does nothing for stopping the victims of crime. So. It, Earlier in the testimony today, Representative Dean asked, what about solutions? How are we going to stop this? So let's ask the questions that are hard to ask, okay? Let's talk about school violence. How many of the school perpetrators of these heinous crimes, and I don't name them, were on SSRI drugs or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors? One of the board members of Firearms Owners Against Crime is a 38-year clinical psychologist. And he says that these drugs are one of the sole motivators for the violent crime and these murders in schools. And yet we don't talk about that. What, does he, what do these drugs do? They forever alter the brain chemistry. Forever. They lead to violent, suicidal, and murderous ideation. So we talk, how, there's a big effort on the part of the governor to go after um, opioids. And yet we don't track SSRI drugs, Prozac, Ritalin. They came into the market in 1988. When did the mass shootings start in earnest? Shortly thereafter. 167 researchers say two things about school shootings. These are directly connected to most of the school shootings and most of the mass shootings. And at the same time, we should stop naming the killers because we are not doing nothing more to making celebrities out of them and encouraging more. And if you want proof, there are books written, numerous books, called Copycatters. Since Columbine, when Klebold and Harris said they wanted to start a revolution, there have been 74 copycatting incidents. So we hear often in the media that the Second Amendment comes with responsibilities. Why well, have news for the media? who can't seem to figure out what kind of guns are really used in crime or in these shootings, that so does the First Amendment. So let's stop. Let's break that chain. Let's tell the media, you can no longer legally identify these criminals, these murderers, in your broadcasts. And that's what the experts want. James Fox from Northwestern University says, this is a clear pathway to encouraging others. This is even brought out in numerous studies and numerous reports. If you want to stop this sort of thing, let's ask the questions that nobody really is comfortable with. And if you want to talk about uh, crime in our, in our streets, I've been in a courts of law. 
I've watched what judges do. The local police, we have police, we have police officers on a member of the board of directors. We have local, state, and federal officers in our organization. And the one thing they tell me, clearly and unequivocally, it's the, the gun charges, the, the use of a firearm in a crime is one of the first things that's plea bargained away. They actually have a term for it in Allegheny County Courts. It's called swallowing the gun. They, the police officers don't even want to bring them to the uh, prosecutors because they don't even use them. And if you ask Detective Joe Fox, it's in my testimony, he considers it a joke. He calls the Philadelphia Justice Center the Injustice Center and said that people that really want to stop crime should put a circle around it. And he was so frustrated, the letter to the editor is in there for you to see. In Allegheny County, there's two million people. The Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, working with the ATF, came up with the number of people that continuously, in almost 90% of the time, commit the violent crime in that area. And that was in 2001. And out of two million people, it was 150 individuals. I've talked to officers in our organization and in the city of Pittsburgh. And they've arrested people sometimes twice in the same night, going out, getting another gun on the street, committing another crime and being rearrested before they finish the first crime's paperwork. And then when they go to trial, they drop the charges. Why do we allow that? Because in my opinion, the courts are taking in really rejecting the authority of the, le le the legislature wants to take and hold these people responsible. This is not something that's not happening. And if we want to have solutions to crime, Representative Dean, let's go after the courts. Let's stop them from doing this. Find a way. Because in Philadelphia, you ask about cases like Khalil Slight. You ask um, about the number of police officers that were killed by repeat, repeat recidivist uh, criminals who I have records on my computer that I can show you all the gun charges are plea bargained away. And then I want to know why organizations come here before these bodies and say we need more sacrifices on freedom. Because make no mistake about it, I'm defending freedom when I'm here. And I'm defending it because we have the freedom now. Every citizen in Pennsylvania, it's not gun owners. Every citizen in Pennsylvania has freedoms that all of you are charged with protecting. And you know that. Many of you take that with a solemn responsibility. So when these groups come up here and they advocate for more laws, they're not advocating for anything that's going to be a compromise. We're not compromising in anything. Basically, they're coming to every citizen. 1.17 million citizens have licenses to carry in this state. And they're saying, we want you to give up a little bit. We're, going to, we're not going to take $20 off you. We're going to take $10 off you in a metaphorical freedom sense. And you're going to be happy. Well, we're getting to the point, Pennsylvania citizens, the gun owners I talk to, that we want to know why. We don't want to know why we're not looking at the laws that have failed. Representative Joswiak talks about support for the PIC system. I make no bones about it. The system doesn't work. So far this year, 16 times it's been down. Not once the national system has been down. Let's talk about the violations of rights. When an individual is denied by the PIC system, for the uh, ability to get a license to carry, they get a letter, as required by law, in writing. But the state police commit a misdemeanor one criminal act every time they give the letter out because it says, for unspecified reasons. In section 6109, it says specifically, the reason must be identified. We tolerate that. Why? That's just one component of this. Now, we, t we talked about the 15-day. Uh, hold before you proceed with a firearm sale. Do you know that the Pennsylvania State Police were called out in 2001 by the Justice Department? Because it's not a 15-day proceed. It's a 15-day and automatically reject. Automatically reject the constitutional right. We are a point of contact state. We have signed an agreement with the federal government. We're supposed to abide by that. That means at the end of that time, the government is supposed to be able to identify that you have a right to bear arms because the state has not identified that you, we can deny you. But we do that. We accept that in this state because the state police are doing it. When a person goes to buy a firearm and they are turned down, 
what actually happens? They buy a firearm and they are denied. They have to go through a challenge process. If they forget the challenge or they decide they don't want to challenge that process, and I'll give you the numbers. On average, right now, it's 14,000 citizens are denied every year out of the nearly three quarters of a million sales. And I'm approximating. Of that, roughly 60% never challenge it. Do we realize that the procedures with the Pennsylvania State Police mean that if you didn't challenge that, that background check doesn't stop? At the end of 90 days, they've lost their rights for the rest of their life. Then when they go in later, thinking that everything was okay, they decided they didn't want to proceed. And they fill that form out saying, no, I was never sentenced to a crime where I could have been prosecuted for. That's unsworn falsification. And I go into court routinely, and I'm a court-recognized expert on this because of the way the laws work. They're facing 12 years in prison for checking one box wrongfully that they didn't know. Unintended consequences? Ladies and gentlemen, we need to look at this. We're charged with a solemn responsibility of protecting rights and freedoms. How does this further the public interest when we go into the courts anywhere in Pennsylvania and criminals walk out of court and don't receive the gun charges? You want to make society safer? Let's fix that loophole. You want to talk about loopholes? I've heard loopholes thrown around here, bannied about like it's uh, some sort of a juggling act. Shira Goodman talked about South Carolina loopholes. Let's finish with the Pennsylvania State Police. Why should we, as citizens, have to pay to exercise a constitutional right? Murdoch versus Pennsylvania in 1943 said, the power to tax is the power to destroy. Pennsylvania lost that. Yet we charge people $2 and $3 for every purchase. Most people say, what does that amount to? The fact is, is constitutionally, it's repugnant. Especially when the national system will do it better and faster and more reliably. Now, Representative Joswiak said the federal system checks, uh, the NIC, NIC system doesn't check as many databases. With all due respect, sir, that's wrong. And Representative Ordete and Representative Gabler, which you all know, went down to the FBI and that was brought out and they actually showed that they don't check more databases. It's, it's the same. The only thing is the state police have not submitted all the temporary PFA data, and that amounts to approximately 1,200 records per year. And it evolves and goes over, over, and over. Why is that important? Because temporary PFAs, if they don't identify them, they can go to another state and buy a gun and the system is blind to it. But we're not fixing the courts. The courts are required to put unique identifiers into the temporary PFAs. So as a component of House Bill 763, which would eliminate the PIC system, turn that money back over to law enforcement so they could go after criminals, is something that would make Pennsylvania unique. It's an amendment. And it empowers the courts and the federal government to check alternative databases for the temporary PFA, like PennDOT. Right now they don't do that. Department of Revenue, to get the unique identifiers. Every state has a problem with temporary PFAs. We want to fix that. That's the purpose of House Bill 763. How many more pe people would be alive? How many more crimes would be stopped if we turned over seven million more dollars? Some say it's 11 million. To the state to go chase criminals. To create a special task force to go after criminals, career criminals. These are all things that we can do to make society safer and we don't need any more laws. So going back to loopholes, Charleston, the failure of the Charleston situation and the reason the person got the gun was inaccurately described. The killer in the uh, Charleston church shooting had, uh, he was under indictment for a drug charge. The local DA knew about it, never informed the FBI. Why? Why wasn't he held responsible as an accessory to the crime? I want to know as a citizen. I want to know why government can take an, make an exception and uh, not do their job. The same thing happened in Parkland. Government dropped the ball. The same thing happened in the Texas church shooting. The government dropped the ball, the Air Force. The same thing happened in Virginia Tech. 
Virginia State Police dropped the ball. I could go on. I've done an awful lot of research on this. Many of you have seen some of the research. Some of it's in my testimony. I'm coming to you today to say that perhaps we're looking in the wrong direction. And I agree heartily, wholeheartedly with what uh, Joshua Prince said about Senate Bill 383. It's a good idea. And it's not about arming all teachers, about giving people a choice to exercise their freedom and a basic right of self-defense. Those very same teachers that we say aren't qualified can walk out, get in their car, and have a firearm and walk through a mall. They're not qualified in school. Why are they qualified in the mall? It sets a dangerous mental precedent that somehow these people can't be trusted. But do we ever look at what Ohio did, a neighboring state? They have the FASTER program. The FASTER program provides for specific methods of training teachers. Can't we do that? Can't we look at real ways to make people safer and create the fear of the unknown in the criminal instead of the parents when they take their kids to the bus stop? I think we can. And then we have the extreme risk protection orders. And as a mechanic all my life, I fix things. So I like to look at things, how they work. And that's why I spend so much time coming up with ways to correct a problem. So let's look at this pragmatically. You're going to have an extreme risk protection order that takes the guns off of someone who is a danger to themselves or others. They're going to leave them access to cars, knives, gasoline. Really? Do I agree with the Mental Health Procedures Act from a constitutional perspective? I have a problem with that. Okay? But from a pragmatic aspect, from the uh, advice of our clinical psychologist on our board. It's a far more effective way than taking a person's guns. And if you look at the process, it's not only ex parte, but there could be as much as 10 days to taking the firearms. And the bills vary between the Senate bill and the two House bills. Why aren't we going to put these people in a place where they can get treatment? I heard the question asked today about by Representative Joswiak. He asked about what happens to the person once you take the guns. That was a great question. What does happen? Voluntary? You get a person that's a danger to themselves. Dr. Charles Gallo would tell you, our board member, that they're not going to go voluntarily and get treatment. That's a pipe dream. Law enforcement officers will tell you that too. So if we're going to use the current laws that will not only take them off the street and keep them put them in a place where they can be evaluated, and at the same time, take their firearms from them. Do I agree with that? No. Do I think that um, it's part of current law? And they do have a recourse, because they can get their uh, rights uh, restored and expunged after one year? That's a possibility. But creating a law that just takes the guns, nothing more than furthering an agenda put forth by organizations that don't respect the Second Amendment. And I have a list of statements here from the organizations that have come before you today on, that undercut their statements about the respect for the rights of all citizens. So the fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, that we don't need more laws. What we need is the constitutional will to ask questions that can make us safer by going after the people in our community that are bad people, that are criminals, that have been self-identified uh, through uh, assessments in the schools and by experts in looking at different ways to do this. So with that, I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman, and thank well, you. Well, thank you, Kim. Uh, any questions or comments for members? Representative Joswiak? Thanks, Kim. Uh, you referred to me on several different issues, and uh, I just, you know, we our, our our end result is probably the same. How we get there is probably a little different. A um, couple things that uh, I think you need to know: all the prosecutions when people go into a store to buy a gun that are prohibited is controlled by the district attorney's office. They all get referred to by the police department that goes in and picks up the guy, which is 
either local police or state police. It's not just state police. Um, there last year was uh, more prosecuted and convictions than ever before in Pennsylvania of people that are prohibited. Now, Pennsylvania PIC system, as you know, I'm a proponent of that. I don't, I don't think at this time in, in today's world that we should do less checking on people to prohibit uh, the bad guys from obtaining guns. And here's what the PICs check. The PICs check the following things. They check the, the Commonwealth Law Enforcement Assistance Network known as CLEAN. They, J, they check JNET, Justice Network. They check Pennsylvania criminal history records, violent juvenile records involving inventor, involuntary commitments and adjudication of incompetence. They check the PFA files, Pennsylvania wanted persons. Um, PICs is the point of contact for the federal government. They check persons who change their names. They also check interstate criminal history records, federal and military records. They check on people who, uh, let's see, includes uh, informed persons subject to civil uh, protection orders, arrest warrants, and Ill immigration violations. They check on illegal and unlawful, unlawful alien records. They check on people who renounce their citizenship mental defectiveness, involuntary commitments, dishonorable discharges from the armed services, and also unlawful users or sellers of controlled substances. That's pretty much the database. I might have missed one or two here, I'm not sure. Um, last year, last year, NICS alone, with their three-day order of uh, issuing uh, approval to purchase guns, I'm sorry, not last year, 2016 records, 4,170 firearms retri uh, retrievals had to be given to the ATF to go back and get people who were prohibited but weren't found in those, in those uh, three days. Pennsylvania's 15-day window is pretty much uh, for people with names like Smith, Jones, Johnson, because they want to make sure they have the right guy to make sure he can have a weapon. Um, those 15 days, they give an absolute yes or a no, if, depending on who it is. The feds are restricted to three days, and that streamlines it, but then you have the chance of giving up uh, a permit or a, a purchase to a prohibited person. Now, last year, there was 120,000 denials, in, or not last year, these are 2016 stats. I can't tell if there was any prosecutions through the NICS system on that. 123 denials of people, 120,000, uh, if there's any prosecutions at all. The PFA orders, at any given time, there's, I'm gonna, you said 1,200, I'm thinking it's more like 1,500. And the reason for that is when, when the temporary PFAs are submitted, uh, a lot of times the, the federal government wants the name, address, social security number, and date of birth. So if you have some people living together and they're there three, four months and one of them gets speed up, they don't know their social security number, they don't know their date of birth even. So the federal government will not enter those into the system. Pennsylvania does enter them into the system. They don't, they don't need that. They do enter those in. So that's, that's, that's just one more thing that, that, that gets checked. Um, let's see, what else? I, I, I did a little bit of comparison here for the fed, federal government and the state government, I, and I think the two of them together are, are doing a pretty good job. Uh, I think we eliminate one, we're eliminating a, something we should not. Uh, and I think you're right when you say there's an epidemic of violence. That's evil people will do evil things no matter how many laws we have, no matter how many restrictions we put in place, evil people will do bad things to people. So with that, uh, you know, it's okay. just my Can comments. I Can I respond? You Can go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, First of all, those databases you mentioned are all covered by the NICS as well, flat out. The other uh, point that you raised was after 15 days, the state police automatically deny. They don't, uh, they don't approve based on. If you go to 15 days, it's an automatic denial. And I can bring in any number of gun dealers, any number of experts to prove that. The other thing is that you talked about, uh, um, I'm trying, there were a number of thoughts in my mind. so. Um, but uh, uh, you mentioned the last part about we have an epidemic of violence. That's not shown by the facts. Facts are that violence, especially uh, this committee was shown a document that showed that in 2006 to 2016 that uh, the uh, uh, number of firearms crime have gone down in Pennsylvania 30%. And 
And those are cold hard facts from the Pennsylvania State Police themselves, which is what they supply to the uh, FBI UCR. And the other thing that you mentioned was we talked about uh, uh, how the state police handle crimes. You were at the meeting two years ago where Major Scott Price sat there and he said to me directly, sitting to my right, that up until that point, they had over 500,000 criminal records they had not put in NCIC. Well, because of what Representative Gabler and what Representative Ortete did last year, those records are now in NCIC. And they, I'm sure you remember hearing that he said it was because of unique identifiers. The fact is, unique identifiers were not a problem. And I had a real problem with those records not being in NCIC because that was a situation that made everybody in the nation m less safe because those records need to be in there. And I think it's important to recognize that 36 states use the National Instant Check System now with no problems. They don't have the difficulties. They don't have the driving uh, dealers out of business. And I want to give you an example, sir, of something they're doing right now. The state police, without statutory authority, are going to dealers, and they want every dealer to check every firearm that comes in over their counter for either consignment sale or trade-in for application against guns known to be used in crime or guns that have been lost or reported stolen. So uh, the pilot project, dealers are refusing to do because it puts enormous liability and risk on them. If they're going to put these firearms in and have it checked while that person's standing there, the process for a gun dealer is they have to put these guns in their day book. They have to recognize that they brought the firearm in and they did a check. Now, is that gun dealer going to return that gun to this person that's prohibited if it comes out, that that gun shouldn't be in his possession? Okay, but the state police are telling them to do that. And George Romanoff at ACE, Joe Keffer, they've appeared before this committee before, will tell you exactly that's what they're doing. And it's their intent to expand this statewide. So they're putting an unfunded mandate on dealers as well as putting them in liability and risk. And who wants to return a gun that shouldn't be in the possession of a criminal? And this is only part and parcel. Representative Martin Kauser, you remember this probably, 2009. He had to go and get uh, dozens of state legislators, House members, to explain to the state police that redefining what an AR-15 is is not within their jurisdiction. And it took the actions of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms to explain to the commissioner at the time that what they were doing was illegal. Not only that, here's the collateral consequences of this determination. If you determine an AR-15 is to be transferred like a handgun, then it's legitimate to be carried under the license to carry firearms because it's now going to be registered as a handgun. So these types of actions, these unnecessary and, in my opinion, ill-conceived ideas uh, are part of the reason why the Pennsylvania State Police should go back to chasing criminals and not chasing criminal records. Uh, okay, I just have one comment. You mentioned the 500,000 records that weren't in the system. Okay, that comes from when the police used to roll fingerprints versus today the live scan machines. So when they'd roll a fingerprint and they'd submit it off to the FBI, the FBI would say, oh, we'll print on your middle index finger or middle, it was a smudge, it wasn't good, they weren't, re, they weren't redone. That's all police departments, not just the state police, every police department. So of those 500,000, we don't know how many of those are disqualifiers. Some may not be, a lot may be. Those, the FBI never put them in their system. Now, you're saying that they did now? Why would they put them in now if they weren't reprinted? That's, that's, that was the, that, why were they rejected to start with? I mean, I mean, that's, I don't know that. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if you do either, but, but I'd like to know that answer. I agree with you, sir. Okay, we have time for uh, two more questions. Representative Dean. Just a comment, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for holding this hearing and the hearings that you held uh, last month. Um, we're at a time, I think we're at a crossroads, and I guess, sadly, uh, these school shootings have brought us to this crossroads. I remember, Mr. Chairman, you opened the first day of hearings by saying you were moved by the children of Parkland, as we all have been. We've been moved by their courage. 
And when we're at a point at this point in the year when 27 children have been killed in schools, we're at a crossroads. The issue of gun violence is big. It's bigger than school shootings. But we're at a choice. We have a place, we have a choice to make here. Do we want to harden our schools more, harden all public places more, make every place like a prison so that when I walk my six-year-old granddaughter into kindergarten, she has to worry about the metal detector, is her teacher armed, are other personnel armed, make sure the doors are hardened, her escape routes have to be clear, she has to learn how to hide and duck and run and fight. We're at a crossroads. Is that the kind of society we want? Or should we as legislators do our job to find legislation that would save lives? I thank you for this hearing and I hope we robustly get these bills to the floor to save some lives in Pennsylvania. Representative Stevens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Kim, for your testimony. Appreciate it. Um, and I know, frankly, many of our past conversations um, about restoration of rights and things like that helped inform some of the provisions that I included in the uh, Extreme Risk Protection Order Bill. But one of the things in particular um, I wanted to to connect with you on here and discuss with you briefly is the the comparison between the extremist protection order and the 302. And I think you mentioned in your testimony that the 302 in your mind was sufficient and preferable to what I've proposed in the extremist protection order. Is that accurate? I believe it's more uh, protective of society in a whole because you take care of a person that you deal with a person that can't, is a danger to themselves or others. Sure. Um, I guess that one of the concerns, and again, I think you brought many of these to my attention. Um, how long is an individual detained? I'm, I'm not sure. That, how many days is an individual detained when they're involved? It's 120 hours. So you're detained for five days. So you're taken away from your family, your work, and everything else like that for five days, unable to leave um, when you've been involuntarily committed. And then, um, and you're ultimately deprived of your gun rights forever. Right? I mean, you and I have had the conversations about how it's, uh, you know, technically you can't get those rights back um, uh, without incurring the expense of Mr. Prince or, or any, any other attorney who might um, be willing to take your case up. And all that happens with virtually no due process. None. So, you know, one of the reasons why I was drawn to the extremist protection order approach is because um, it, I felt it was less invasive. It didn't require you be detained and removed from your family and work and everything else like that for five days. Um, it wasn't as permanent in terms of your Second Amendment rights. It wasn't a lifetime ban with no ability to have them restored. Um, and it also provided all those other due process protections that the 302 process doesn't have. So I, I guess I'm... Maybe you and I can talk offline at some point. I'm always willing to have a conversation with you and try to work with you on this. But it just seems, you know, from my perspective, that the the extremist protection order approach would be far preferable to the 302 approach um, for those reasons. And you know, I don't know if you have a brief comment on that. I know the chairman wants to wrap up the hearing, but uh, you know, I'm happy to listen and, and maybe we can talk offline about it further. I'd be happy to talk with you offline. I look at this from a citizen. If you've got a person that's a danger to themselves or others, do we want them to have access to anything else that could commit harm? Look at the people that have used trucks and cars to mow down people. Um, at the same time, uh, we've talked about suicide. And it's great to talk about suicide with firearms being uh, an issue where we could address that. But we're not looking at the underlying problem. And you look at other countries, Japan, their suicide rate's three times ours. The substitution issue. We don't talk about that. And I think that it's important, if we're going to talk about an issue, let's look at all the elements of it. Because if we don't look at those aspects of it, we're not really trying to fix the problem. You know what I mean? I would like to see those people get help and not have any risk whatsoever. We take a firearm, but we leave them have access to knives or poison or whatever. And uh, despite what the testimony I've heard here today, it did not talk about those aspects and the number of people to substitute the, the method. So, ERPOs, uh, by the way, an ERPO came from a pro-gun group, Second Amendment Foundation, up in the state of Washington. They're the ones that put this whole concept together first. But we also have to recognize California in the YouTube shooting, they had access to the, uh, the uh, ERPO in that state and they didn't use it. 
So um, it's a very new concept, and it hasn't had a chance to gel and see the side effects, the unintended consequences. And to say that it's a great thing and it's going to work, um, and this is not meant personally or anything, but I just think it's premature. And uh, could it be something? Uh, maybe we can even work with you and make it uh, something that's um, beneficial in the long run. But it's not the only way people cause harm. And I think that uh, we don't want to see headlines in the news. Well, they came in and took his guns, but he went out and rented a truck and killed a person. Why didn't they put him in a psychological war? And that would really tarnish everybody's idea of whether this concept is worthwhile. Sure. No, and, and I certainly can appreciate some of those concerns. I think this. I think the first one um, was back in 1999 in Connecticut, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you know, so we do have. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We do have some examples. Um, you know, Indiana, Connecticut, Oregon, Washington, California. Um, those states. It's been around for a little while. Um, and I think I do think we did hear some testimony about the substitution issue and and the finality of folks that choose to commit suicide and they use the firearm and the and the uh, accelerator rate of those who possess firearms um, and want to commit suicide, choosing the firearm as the, the method to, and I think we can agree, it, you know, obviously is irreversible in most instances. So, um, you know, let's, let's continue to have the dialogue and see, um, you know, if we can't find that common ground to, uh, uh, to make the, uh, the bill palatable and, and something that you could ultimately support. But I did have the, a lot of our conversations about your criticisms of the 302 process in my head as we were drafting this, this bill. Kim, thank you very much for your time, your testimony. It's always good to see you. Thank you so much. So we have, uh, we did uh, extend an invitation to the National Rifle Association, but they were not able to make it today. And uh, we have submitted uh, testimony from Molly Gill, Families Against Mandatory Minimums. So folks, we're gonna wrap this up. I just wanna thank, once again, Harrisburg University for their generous hospitality. Thank uh, all the members of the committee for being here today and throughout all the hearings. And thank the testifiers uh, that came forward today. Um, we had, I think, uh, was seven hearings, public hearings. Uh, and I just want to say one thing. It's, uh, I just hope that we find common ground. Thank you very much. This uh, adjourns the hearing. <laughs>